I'd like to call the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to order at this time. Uh, prior to taking roll call, perhaps, uh, Councillor, would you like to swear in Mr. Grant? And he, you can stay up there and perhaps he could come here in front of you. Thank you. That Good way evening. you don't have to <laughs> make it down. Thank you. Good evening, members of the Planning and Zoning Commission. I appreciate your flexibility with my immobility this evening. Mr. Romy Grant, if you could just stand at the podium where there's a microphone. And I'm going to say a few words, but I'll just ask you to repeat after me. If you could please raise your right hand. I state your name. I, Romy Grant. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. Protect and defend. Protect and defend. The Constitution. The Constitution. And government. And government. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the state of Florida. And the state of Florida. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Domestic or foreign. Domestic or foreign. And that I will bear. And that I will bear. True faith. True faith. Loyalty and allegiance. Loyalty and obedience. obedience to the same. To the same. And that I am entitled. And that I am entitled. To hold office. To hold office. Under the Constitution. Under the Constitution. That I will faithfully perform. That I will faithfully perform. All of the duties. All the duties. Of the office. Of the office. Of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Of the City of Titusville. Of the City of Titusville. On which I am about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Mr. Grant. You are now officially a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission, and we welcome you to take your seat and join the commission in their official duties this evening. Thank you very much. At, at this time, let's have the roll call. Chairman Sievers? Here. Vice Chairman Richardson? Here. Secretary Spidell? Here. Member Grant? Here. Member Murray? Here. Member Taylor? Member Porter? Here. School Board Member Boyer? Uh, obviously, we, we do have a quorum. Uh, looking at the agenda, do you want to go ahead and read the notice or if you want to for the purposes of this meeting? Sure, I'd be happy to. Give me one second. All persons who anticipate, I'll, I'll skip ahead to the CMT notice yes. for this meeting. The Planning and Zoning Commission may be conducted utilizing communications media technology, CMT, as provided in section 120.54, section 5B2 of Florida statutes. In order to help prevent the spread of the COVID-19 coronavirus, and to comply with all local, state, and federal laws and guidelines regarding social distancing and social gatherings, designated seating shall be provided for the public within City Hall. Individual speakers shall, when directed to do so, be given the opportunity to speak on agenda items at City Hall during the meeting in accordance with Resolution Number 16-2020. Signs held by speakers are permissible but no tripods, easels, props, or other demonstrative aids shall be brought into City Hall. In addition to the regular broadcast of the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting via closed circuit television and live stream YouTube video, which may be accessed through the city's website, video and audio of the meeting will also be provided within City Hall for the public in attendance. As an additional method for public participation, the public may submit written comments via email to planning at titusville.com or by regular mail to Planning and Zoning Commission's attention at City Hall 555 South Washington Ave, Titusville, Florida 32796. Written comments must be received by noon 12 p.m. prior to the start of the meeting and include the sender's name address and the subject line, which must specify the agenda item being addressed. All comments will be disseminated to the Planning and Zoning Commission members and made a part of the public record prior to any action being taken. Speakers who appear in person will be subject to screening for symptoms of COVID-19 and any persons exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19 will not be permitted to enter City Hall. Okay, thank you. Uh, the agenda is uh, reflects under item number for that uh, a commission issues an agenda requests and b is rules and procedures we were in the middle of rules and procedures therefore i would 
uh, ask that we go, go to that, uh, that section. And as I recall, we pretty well got through uh, public records, sunshine law, et cetera. Uh, may have been down to uh, ex parte communications, et cetera. There was a suggestion that uh, if we have questions to relay those to the assistant city attorney. Uh, I I'm really turning this over to you. Uh, I would respectfully ask that we not go in as much detail as last time, but if there are questions or areas that should be highlighted, uh, my goal would be that um, uh, we finish up that item by 545 at, at the latest, and perhaps then we have a few minutes for commission's issues and agenda. So, thank, thank you, you Chairman Sievers. I'd like to begin by jumping back to the report that was presented that has a number of seven items that have correspond to the attachments that were presented to you, both for this meeting and the prior workshop. We have covered planning and zoning powers and duties. That was the code section. And we covered number three, open government overview prepared by the Attorney General's office. The next four items, four, five, six, and seven, remain to be discussed. And, and if there are any questions on any number of these seven, then I'd like to welcome that. I'd like to go over just three points that I pulled out of all of those pieces of materials that I sent you to just read three sections that I find to be of particular importance that I'd like to highlight. And I'm going to start with number four, the government in the sunshine, voting laws, voting conflicts in Roberts Rules of Order, that particular item. And I'm going to skip ahead to the section that talks about ex parte communications. And I'm going to just tell you what the process is in the event that you receive ex parte communications. And and that's, about, that's about page 40 of your agenda. Thank you, sir. Communications. Go ahead. So in this section, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'd like to read sections A, B, and C of the process and procedure to make sure that you understand the way to cure an ex parte communication. In the event that a member of a board receives an ex parte communication outside of the hearing or proceeding before the board, the member shall disclose and make a part of the record before any final action is taken the identity of the person, group, or entity with whom the communication took place and the subject of communication, including all opinions or facts discussed. Said disclosure shall be made before or during the public hearing at which a vote is to be taken on said matter and any persons having opinions contrary to those expressed in the ex parte communication shall be given a reasonable opportunity to refute, rebut, or respond to the communication. I have to point out these are specifically rules for quasi-judicial proceedings. So if you receive these ex parte communications, communications that would influence your vote on this type of a hearing matter, that's when you need to have that extra level of caution when the public hearing begins and as a commission you start to discuss and the chairman asks, have you had any communications with anyone to talk about this item that you're going to make a decision on? So. I don't necessarily need to read B and C. I'm going to right now just emphasize that the process is defined in this section and the presumption can be cleared, you can clear the air in the event that an ex parte communication should occur as described in this section. A disclosure that is made in accordance with the process that we have in this rule, then it will remove the presumption of the prejudice that you have created and it will clear the air from that ex parte communication where the communication has occurred. Okay, are there any questions on that process? I don't see any. Okay, the next section under this number four is voting and I'd like to just say one thing that unless you have a conflict, all members who are present at the meeting must vote. Are there any questions under section four of my agenda packet for this evening? Have you all had the opportunity to review the slideshow that was under number five, the decision making process, legislative versus quasi judicial? Do any of you all have questions on this section? Would you like me to go in detail into this slideshow? 
because after I go through a couple more points, I'm going to go into some questions. I did receive two questions from one board member that I'm going to go into detail on after I get through this section of the materials. So are there any going once, going twice? Okay. The next section on the agenda is I'm sorry, before we move on from this, the Attorney General's opinion that was included in it is part of what I wanted to touch on next. The Attorney General's opinion number 2007-35 is in regards to the Sunshine Law and exchange of documents. The summary is in the end of this uh, opinion, which I would like to read, and then I'll go into one of the questions that I received. While it is not a direct violation of the Sunshine Law for members to circulate their own written position statements to other council members, so long as the council members avoid any discussion or debate among themselves on these statements, the members' discussions or deliberations on matters coming before the commission must occur at a duly noticed commission, city commission meeting, and the circulation of these position statements must not be used to circumvent the requirements of the statute. Thus, as stated in Attorney General Opinion 01-21, this office would strongly discourage such a practice. Now, my office agrees with the Attorney General's opinion that was just summarized in regards to a single board member who has a desire to share information outside of the public meeting. I received a question that reads as follows. The first has to do with Florida Attorney General Advisory Legal Opinion. I will use an example in order to better understand the flow of communications. If I had a website, for example, the City of St. Louis Park and Comprehensive Plan, Google search City of St. Louis Park Comprehensive Plan, that I intend to reference as it relates to my past experience, can I send this to all the members of Planning and Zoning Commission so that they can see the document? Here's my answer. No, you are not advised to directly communicate your own research, resources, and opinions outside of the public meeting. You may work with staff to provide documents slash links to all members, but you cannot use the staff as a liaison to convey your opinions. Our legal opinion is that the best time to share information with your fellow board members is during the public meeting where the resources or documents can become available to the public at the same time as your fellow commissioners. While it is not a direct violation of the Sunshine Law, to present documents to other members. If any fellow member then responds, it would become a violation at that point. Thus, as emphasized by the opinion, the Attorney General would strongly discourage such a practice. My office concurs with this recommendation. Would you all like to have any discussion or questions on this statement or position that the City Attorney's Office has made in line with the Attorney General's Office? If a commissioner desires to uh, provide information to staff, which they request be shared in advance of the meeting to the other commissioners with express instructions that uh, the other commissioners shall not respond, that it will be discussed at the uh, next meeting this is sent for informational purposes only, so other commissioners may be familiar with certain information. Uh, you're advising against that, as I understand, even though the Attorney General says you can do that, provide you have the safeguards. Correct. The safeguards are tough to maintain, and the city doesn't have the control of those actions outside of our ability to say who's communicating with who. And so it, the, the safeguard is created to prevent any communication that would be inadvertent. The policy of the city is that we prefer that the communication be sent through staff. And if it's a position paper, then I don't believe that staff would disseminate it 
unless it was at a public meeting. If it's a resource like a website, I think that that is more neutral and not conveying one's particular opinion. And I think that the staff has the discretion to disseminate that information. But at the end of the day, my recommendation is going to be simply to ask you all to take the time at a public meeting to, under reports, share your positions, resources, documents, links, et cetera, when it is open to the public to also weigh in and receive that information at the same time. Because if information is being shared behind closed doors, if you will, and you all are receiving it and reading it, it's not a part of your agenda packet, it's not a part of the conversation, it's not a part of the meeting, how is anyone in the public supposed to know that that's something that you're relying upon? Well, first of all, the staff can easily take care of that by putting it uh, out to the public, uh, send it out or include it as an addendum to the agenda so that the public is aware of it. Uh, my concern is we have so much <laughs> to do and so many times uh, during the course of our deliberations we are told, well, you have to act on this at the next meeting because it's advertised uh, five, six, seven days later at a city council meeting, and here I'm springing a uh, five-page document on my fellow commissioners, which they have not had a chance to review or deliberate. They may want to review it, deliberate, and we're told we're not going to give you the time to do that. And I, I have a problem with that. I just I have a problem with that, and I. If, if commissioners will not follow your advice with the safeguards which the Attorney General clearly says how to do it, um, I, I think it hamstrings us uh, commissioners in uh, doing our, our job. And I, I know we, the staff has sent uh, my comments concerning the comprehensive plan Joe's comments concerning the comprehensive plan in advance. And then the one time I asked <laughs> to share information as far as the questions on Brookshire with fellow commissions with instructions not to respond, uh, staff says no. I, I, we can't have a double-edged sword here. So I understand your opinion, and I understand the nature of it, and you're trying to protect us. I understand that. I am. I, I don't know whether any other commissioners have any questions and all, but if not, let's Actually, move on. Okay, well, so, yes, sir. So my question is, if we decided to forward that information to the commissioners and we didn't comment before the meeting, is it a violation? You're suggesting that we don't, but I'm saying if we do, are we breaking the sunshine law? I think you might need to speak closer to your microphone. Just if you could just turn it toward you. Thanks. So my question is, I hear your recommendation. And you also said it's not a violation as far as the Attorney General. So if we decided to pass that information on to the commissioners with those stipulations that we don't discuss it or pass it on. Is it a violation? A commissioner may send informational material to other commissioners outside of a meeting provided that there is no interaction between or response from other commissioners. So it's not a violation you're just suggesting for our own protection. That's the that reason we why we have taken this position, yes. So if we pass it on and we didn't discuss it, are we in violation? We're not in violation. You would not be. Go, go, go ahead, <laughs> Commissioner. Can you guess who asked the question? <laughs> Um, I just wanted to do a couple clarifications because it was really helpful when you responded back to me and we figured out a way to get the information in the meeting. Um, but I think a couple things play into this and one is we have some retention requirements and some other things that 
feed into this that also make this more complicated. And I agree with Chairman Sievers as far as the information flow. Sometimes it would be really nice to have this information come between us, but it's just that kind of funny line that we have to walk as far as that. And the other component was that we don't overwhelm the staff, but because it has to pass through the staff out to everybody to do it correctly. So it was. Re I really appreciated your response from that perspective, of explaining the staff process, and then reminding me of the fact that yes, we could potentially do it, but was there a better way to accommodate that? And like Chairman Siever said, a lot of information flows, and it would be so nice to be able to sometimes have a, a point of reference, not an opinion, a point of reference that could help people better understand. So um, I'm going to completely abide by the way that you encouraged me to, but I think it's frustrating. Um, the Sunshine Law's intentions are great. It just makes it hard to do your job sometimes. Any other questions? Why don't you go ahead and proceed? Jesse, before you proceed, are we being televised? Is this meeting televised? Is I believe that, that the answer is yes. Blocking the view of the television audience. This is a separate presentation system for you guys to see what they have on the computer. Okay. The audience is seeing you at the time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the next section on my presentation is number six, resolution num number 24-1997. This is a 11 page document that we have had, like it says, since 1997. And it lays out the parameters for a quasi-judicial hearing process. And it goes into specific detail. Are there any questions about this resolution that you should always have with you? Go ahead, Joe. I wasn't asking a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Does everyone have a printed copy of this? Or a, okay. The last three sections of my agenda, I have 15 minutes or so to go into these three laws. And if you have any questions on them, of course, we can end sooner if we, if we don't. But the first, and they're similar, but they have different nuances. And actually, I'm going to do this one a bit different by going into the second question received, because I think it's going to take some time for me to understand and explain everything about these. So the second question says that this second question has to do with the Burt Harris Act. Here's the hypothetical based on current ordinances. A developer asking for a zoning change does a presentation that includes a concept drawing. During the presentation, they discuss the project and talk about the potential occupancy, which exceeds our requirements, the potential dining and open space requirements, which exceeds our requirements, and other potential items that exceed our requirements. Staff clarifies that the discussion exceeds the requirements for this type of development. Can we make these items a condition for approval of the zoning change? Here's my answer. The hypothetical you have described sounds more like the statutory prohibition against imposing conditions on development found in Florida Statute 70.45 governmental exactions. If the developer Impose, if the developer volunteers to do more than is required of the applicant in a concept plan, then the applicant would not be implicated by Burt Harris Act because the city did not impose the requirement. The Burt Harris Act applies to a situation of an inordinate burden that is imposed by the government on an owner who wants to develop their property as a result of a new law that has reduced the owner's ability to develop as they intended prior to the local law changing. And I would need to better understand your question in order to answer this one. So either you can chime in now or let me go over these three real quick. I'll summarize the three laws and then we can go into greater detail on that hypothetical. Sound good? Okay. 
So 70.45 is governmental exactions, also known as imposing conditions on development. And this language, this statute, talks about a prohibited exaction, which is when a local government who is making a decision says that you need to do these certain conditions in order to get your approval. A prohibited exaction means any condition that is imposed by a governmental entity on a property owner's proposed use of real property that lacks an essential nexus to a legitimate public purpose and is not roughly proportionate to the impacts of the proposed use that the governmental entity seeks to avoid, minimize, or mitigate. In addition to other remedies available in law or equity, a property owner may bring an action in a court of competent jurisdiction under this section to recover damages caused by a prohibited exaction, otherwise known as a condition that does not have an essential nexus. Such act action may not be brought until a prohibited exaction is actually imposed or required in writing as a final condition of approval for the requested use of the real property. The right to bring an action under this section may not be waived. This section does not apply to impact fees adopted under Chapter 163 or non ad valorem assessments as defined in 197. In summary, this exaction statute places the burden on the government to prove the exaction has an essential nexus to a legitimate public purpose and is roughly proportionate to the impacts of the proposed use that the government governmental entity is seeking to avoid, minimize, or mitigate. The property owner's right to bring an action under this statute may not be waived. On the other hand, we have the Burt Harris Act, which was the subject of the question, but I think, I think the question was more about exactions because of the way it was described. The Burt Harris Act is, states the following. In addition to the exaction concerns that we just reviewed, the issue of whether or not restrictions imposed on development would result in an inordinate burden, those are the key words for this statute, on the property, and thereby constitute a compensable claim by the property owner under Florida statutes must be considered. The Burt Harris Act, Florida Statute 70.001, is a statute that is designed to be protective of property rights by recognizing that some laws, regulations, or ordinances, as applied, may inordinately burden, restrict, or limit private property rights short of amounting to a taking under the Constitution. And therefore, this statute provides a separate cause of action to provide relief or payment or comp of compensation when a new law, rule, regulation, or ordinance unfairly affects real property. It is the intent of the legislature that as a separate and distinct cause of action from the law of takings, the legislature herein provides relief, payment of compensation when a new law, rule, regulation, or ordinance of the state or a political entity in the state as applied unfairly affects real property. When a specific action of a governmental entity has inordinately burdened an existing use of real property or a vested right to a specific use of a real property, the property owner of that real property is entitled to relief, which may include compensation for the actual loss of the fair market value of the property caused by the action of government as provided in this section. And lastly, for this section, I'm going to read you the definition of what is an inordinate burden or inordinately burdened. It means that an action of one or more governmental entities has directly restricted or limited the use of real property such that the property owner is permanently unable to attain the reasonable investment-backed expectation for the existing use of the real property or a vested right to the specific use of the real property with respect to the real property as a whole or that the property owner is left with existing or vested uses that are unreasonable such that the property owner bears permanently a disproportionate share of a burden imposed for the good of the public, which in fairness should be borne by the public at large. It does not include temporary impacts to real property, impacts to real property occasioned by government abatement, prohibition, prevention, or remediation of a public nuisance at common law, or noxious use of private property or impacts to real property caused by an action of governmental entity 
taken to grant relief to a property owner under this section. And a temporary impact on development is defined as something that is in effect for longer than one year. It, uh, so, I'm sorry, a temporary impact that is in effect for longer than one year may constitute an inordinate, inordinate burden as provided under this law. So at this point, I'd like to ask Ms. M Member Murray for clarification on your question. It, it, it's one of those situations, again, having dealt in other states on processes. So here we come to a concept plan, potentially, and the ordinance is going to change based on the second reading coming up on concept plans and how valid they are and what you can hold someone to. The challenge with concept plans sometimes is there is a lot of unknowns about a piece of land. And every place else that I've been, a concept plan is just literally that, a concept. So to potentially attach anything above and beyond the actual code or ordinance had always been inappropriate where I've been before because it's a concept. Now, as you move forward, you could potentially negotiate things above and beyond that based on certain circumstances that came up. So the reason for asking the question was, again, for clarification on if it fell into our laws, and if so, where was that line in which we would potentially cross it, and a nexus situation would arise. And as long-winded as all of your reading was, it actually made a lot of sense in clarifying that. And again, my concern always is, is that we don't burden a developer or a business to a level that makes it unreasonable for them. And like I said, concept plans are kind of scary for me mm -hmm. because of knowing just how almost pie in the sky they can be. There's too many unknowns. So the application for Burt Harris on the big picture is that the new rules, laws that are going to apply to the city as a whole, like the concept plan ordinance, would be something that could be um, used in the, not necessarily the concept plan, maybe something else that changes the use in a particular zoning category, saying that something is no longer allowed in residential or mm -hmm. something like that. When somebody has a property that's residential and they have the expectations of doing something, and then the city changes the code to disallow that activity, right. that would be an example of a Bird Harris type claim, where the scenario you described with the concept plan is more about a specific property and a specific set of conditions that were applied that may or may not have that essential nexus. And so that would be the question in the test is, is there an essential nexus between the concept conditions or the conditions of approval of any um, item that comes before you and whether or not the essential nexus is there? And if not, then do, is that developer being told to do something that would be um, an exaction? Got it. 70.45. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have any questions? I'd like to follow it up with a couple of uh, comments, uh, concerns. Uh, one of the th uh, essential nexus and uh, Bert Harris and all this terminology is very interesting. <laughs> but for the average city council member or the average commissioner, they may or may not understand that. Uh, I would respectfully ask that either staff or uh, the attorney on occasion when we have a, a commissioner wanting to add a condition that probably is appropriate under the circumstances such as uh, dedicating an additional 10 feet of right of way uh, because the existing roadway is, uh, is too narrow. Uh, that uh, the uh, not all of us can articulate it very clearly in a form and a fashion that may be appropriate. And I've seen occasions in which uh, commission members probably have the right concept, but they have a hard time articulating it in a manner that may or may not be acceptable and I would respectfully suggest that uh, there's nothing wrong 
uh, not that you're trying to tell somebody what to do, but you're just helping them in proper wording of a motion or condition. The second aspect that concerns me is, for example, when the city council changes uh, the height limit along the Indian River from uh, 50 feet to 150 feet, is the city council advised, is the commission advised, council, two years, five years from now, if you want to change that back to 50 feet, you very well may have set up a, um, a bird Harris claim. Council members need to be advised what the consequences of their decisions are. If they're fully satisfied with that, that's fine. But I don't think most council members are familiar enough with bird hairs, <laughs> extractions, and they need assistance along the way. And uh, I don't know what the policy is, but I, I feel as though it's important that uh, they understand the pros and cons, the consequences of their uh, actions, because they can't have consequences. There's uh, many times a desire to uh, change regulations on occasion to make them more flexible, more developer friendly, et cetera. And then you have another group get in that uh, wants to do the opposite. And uh, uh, with Bert Harris, everybody needs to understand the consequences of it. So that, that's just a, my comment or suggestion along the way in helping commissioners. Any other uh, items you want to discuss under that? I believe that covers the city council and the substance of the things that I wanted to hit this evening. Commissioner. Yes, when was this Burt Harris provision enacted? Um, I can tell you in just a moment. at least a decade, but just give me a second. Or just the effective date. My computer's loading. Huh? My computer's loading. Okay. I'm sure it's uh, around the 1990s, uh, along in that era. How about you, Brian? 1995. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. There Thank we you. go. Sorry, I'll write it down so I have it for next time. Any other uh, questions, staff? Do you have any comments, sir? No, sir. Okay. Uh, one, I, I know uh, there wasn't a question about it, but uh, if they, if someone on the planning and zoning his only commission does have a conflict of, on an item and they disclose properly by filling out the required form or disclose before the uh, meeting um, starts or discussion starts on it, can they continue to participate in the discussion of the item? I believe they can as long as you're not being paid as a contractor or consultant by another for the work that you're doing to lobby for that position. Okay. I, I just want to make sure commissioner members understand that uh, as long as you do the proper disclosure as an appointed member here, I don't think council can do so, but you can participate in the discussion. Under certain nuances, as I've described. Pardon? With the certain nuances, as I've described. Yes. And the way that I read it when I was reading it over the last few days was you can participate in the discussion. You cannot participate in the vote. Correct. Correct. You cannot vote. Just for clarification. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Any other items? If I still have the floor, I'd like to touch on two more things that were from the last meeting. Okay. You have three minutes. Okay. Well, it'll be fast. Um, one of the questions was on the retention period of public records emails that were sent to commissioners. That developed some interesting conversation. And, and 
There's two sections of the public record retention guideline that I'd like to tell you about. One is general correspondence. Any general correspondence regarding administrative matters, things related to the city, the retention period is three years. For complaints from a citizen regarding something related to the city, the retention period is specifically one year after resolution of the issue. So there's some subject to interpretation with all public record laws, requests, and questions regarding this big law that governs all of our communications, written correspondence, etc. To that end, I have reached out to the city's IT staff and created email addresses for all of you to retain your public records through the city's email address. I would like to go through that with you individually at some other time so we can either talk about that on a break tonight or by phone or email tomorrow or later. So I just wanted to let you know those follow-up pieces of information and I think I hit my three minutes. What I'd like to do now is uh, in the agenda return to 4A with uh, commission issues, agenda requests, and um, certainly recognize anyone that has certain issues. They, th they believe that the commission sh should review uh, or ideas that you have that perhaps we ought to discuss uh, as such. And um, as I understand the process, basically, uh, if we thought it appropriate to recommend to the city council, they review uh, a change in a code uh, that would be forward then to the city council and they would be an advisability determination and staff input as to whether or not uh, uh, council would authorize proceeding. So, are there any items that, uh, okay. I prepared a list back in May. <laughs> I haven't been able to send it to you. <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And some of these, Brad and I did go over uh, uh, previously. Obviously, the first one I had on there, the comprehensive plan, now we're talking about it. But in May, I wasn't sure of the status. Likewise, the tree ordinance, I wasn't sure of the status. This uh, C, low impact development, I have heard that that's in process. Do we have an estimated date? I mean, for the current comprehensive plan, we are required to have something in place by the end of this year. So we hope to have something to you very soon. Okay. Uh, the PD ordinance, which is one of the items that uh, you, you see its application on our next agenda, and we're not going to really talk about that other than there has been a lot of discussion six months ago or more that it was going to be changed, updated, amended. And... Um, Brad, is there? So where, where are we? <laughs> so as far as the, uh, there are two parts to this. There is the open space definitions and criteria, and that is another direction we've received from City Council to update. So we are in the process of coming up with a new ordinance just on open space requirements. Then we've also talked about as part of the another agenda item on your next meeting about the compre draft comprehensive plan and about coming up with some kind of minimum standards for mixed use type developments that would be approved through the um, a plan development of some sort. So that's a more long-term project though. So currently we have an open space draft ordinance we're look working on and long-term a more mixed use type ordinance possibly that could be incorporated as part of our current PD process. That's what this is referring to, I believe. Uh, Item E and F um, d primarily deal with the area of critical concern. Uh, a lot of jurisdictions require, require within the uh, area of critical concern where you uh, want to uh, uh, retain uh, the water in the area 
and not use it up with certain kinds of grasses that are high demand. Uh, they do not allow uh, high con consumption. They encourage friendly. Uh, we now have some of that suggestion I had made last year, uh, mentioned in the comprehensive plan amendment uh, that you're incorporating in there. But in my mind, there's no need to hold that up <laughs> and waiting. We can amend the ordinance easily at some point in time. I'm just talking a little bit about these and perhaps we can talk about it later and uh, be happy to answer any questions you, you have. The next one, River Palms, we will discuss that under um, the next uh, meeting. Uh, I've mentioned many times about Indian River protections and how we can better protect the Indian River. Uh, I think that's an issue we ought to discuss and determine what additional things can be done. The platting process and procedures, I've talked about this for a year. <laughs> Uh, and at some point in time, I would respectfully suggest uh, that we uh, talk about in greater detail. The city of Titusville is the only city in Bavard County that does not review the preliminary plat. All those issues are left to staff to, to review, and though it's part of the most critical time, whether you determine whether or not there's compliance with uh, wetlands, compliance with, uh, with uh, the area, the buffer around wetlands, the tree survey. Uh, for example, uh, one development, uh, there was 103 trees uh, removed as a part of that development. City Council nor Planning and Zoning Commission ever saw that. All we review is the sketch plat. Uh, fortunately, we're expanding a little bit about that, but I would like us to talk about that more because we're the only city that does not review the preliminary plat where you really get a lot of the details of, of the process. I appreciate uh, staff pointing to um, uh, where we can see online the status of a lot of projects, uh, if there's any there. Uh, Brad, you and I have talking about, talked about a little about uh, uh, Antigua Bay, and uh, that's an example of a project where we potentially have a, a development where you could have uh, housing more appropriate for executives, uh, engineers, etc. Over the last couple of years, all of our housing have been uh, geared more towards the low, uh, low 200s. A lot of people go to other areas in the county if they're an executive because we do not have the housing type and we're not building the housing type where they want to live in Titusville. And I think we need to uh, look at that, think about it, and see what we can do about it. Um, is there any ones that you would like to comment at all, Brad, that I'd listed here? Well, no, sir, if there are any questions about any of these, uh, if I don't know them, I'll certainly try to come back and see if we can find the right person to maybe answer a question you might have any about any particular project. Okay. That's all I had. I'd like to bring I'll probably bring these back to you. I just, this is informational at this stage. <laughs> um, two things stick out yes. um, that I've been pondering. And one is from an environmental perspective, um, times have changed drastically. Um, and whether or not we're looking at some of the alternatives in regard to turf grasses and some of these other things, not only being in the critical area, but again, as the prime example I can think of is the development that just took place or is taking place at uh, South and Cheney. You know, they got great little hedge going around there. It sure would have been nice if that had been native landscaping versus something that needs excessive water and fertilizing and, and that type of stuff. I think there's just some recommendations we could make 
that potentially doesn't have a high impact on developers. And then the second component is housing, because I think housing, especially when we look at all the things associated with a comprehensive plan, whether it's multimodal or you know, preserving wetlands, we almost need to rethink, and parking as an example, we need to almost do a little strategizing and rethinking on whether or not there's some ways that we can make that a little more interesting. You know, where's the executive housing? Where's the condominium that has a grocery store down below and a parking lot? And some of those things that I'm more used to and whether or not it doesn't solve some of the challenges we have. Um, the almost zero lot line $200,000 house, although it's great, I think creates some environmental challenges and some multimodal challenges. And I don't know, we take a step back and say, what else do we want to encourage in our economic strategy for people to come here? Um, and those are all comp plan things we can potentially do to make sure we have other options. It just seems to be somewhat narrow right now. So that's okay. just my thought process. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, in looking around, uh, I traveled uh, probably the, the three or four most recent developments. We encourage native vegetation, Florida friendly, but we don't require it. Many jurisdictions, 75% of the landscaping has to be, and I tell you, a lot of What's been planted in these most recent developments are not Florida friendly at all. They require lots and lots and lots of water. And why we continue to um, allow that, I don't understand, frankly. So, uh, but we do. So, uh, anyone else have any items they would like to? Uh, Discuss under this this particular one. If not, we're down to petitions requests from the public. Do we have anybody that would like to be heard under petitions and request? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. We will resume at six o'clock.
I'd like to call the meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order at this time. Let us uh, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We could have the roll call. Chairman Severs. Present. Vice Chairman Richardson. Here. Secretary Spidell. Here. Member Grant. Here. Member Murray. Here. Member Taylor. Member Porter. Here. School Board Member Boyer. We do have a quorum. At this time, if we could read uh, Assistant City Attorney, <laughs> the notice. All persons who anticipate speaking on any public hearing item must fill out an oath card to be heard on that agenda item and sign the oath contained thereon. These cards are located on the table near the entrance to the council chamber or may be obtained from the recording secretary. This meeting will be conducted in accordance to the procedure adopted in resolution number 24-1997. Those speaking in favor of a request will be heard first, those opposed will be heard second, and those who wish to make a public comment on the item will be heard third. The applicant may make a brief rebuttal if necessary. A representative from either side, for or against, may cross-examine a witness. Anyone who speaks is considered a witness. If you have photographs, sketches, or documents that you desire for the commission to consider, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the city. Please submit such exhibits to the recording secretary. The Planning and Zoning Commission meeting may be conducted utilizing Communications Media Technology, CMT, as provided in Section 120.54, Section 5B2 of Florida Statutes. In order to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 coronavirus and to comply with all local, state, and federal laws and guidelines regarding social distancing and social gatherings, designated seating shall be provided for the public within City Hall. Individual speakers shall, when directed to do so, be given the opportunity to speak on agenda items at City Hall during the meeting in accordance with Resolution Number 16-2020. Signs held by speakers are permissible, but no tripods, easels, props, or other demonstrative aids shall be brought into the City Hall. In addition to the regular broadcast of the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting via closed circuit television and live stream YouTube video, which may be accessed through the City's website, video and audio of the meeting will also be provided within City Hall for the public in attendance. As an, addi an additional method for public participation, the public may submit written comments via email to planning at titusville.com or by regular mail to Planning and Zoning Commission's attention at City Hall 555 South Washington Avenue, Titusville, Florida 32796. Written comments must be received by noon prior to the start of the meeting and include the sender's name, address, and the subject line must specify the agenda item being addressed. All comments will be disseminated to the Planning and Zoning Commission members and made a part of the public record prior to any action being taken. Speakers who appear in person will be subject to screening for symptoms of COVID-19 and any persons exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19 will not be permitted to enter City Hall. Thank you. Uh, there's no consent agenda items, old business, uh, a new business, uh, we do have some items that I believe are quasi-judicial in nature. Therefore, I'm going to read the quasi-judicial procedures uh, as follows. Certain items under old and new business may be public hearing items. Individuals desiring to speak on those items must fill out an oath card and sign the oath cards contained, the oath contained thereon. Those cards are located near the entrance to the council chamber or can be obtained from the recording secretary. Some items which will be identified by the chairman are quasi-judicial items and those individuals desiring to speak in favor will speak first and those opposed second and those with a public comment third. The applicant may make a brief rebuttal if necessary. Witnesses may be cross-examined by the applicant, commission members, staff, 
or other such representative as authorized by the Commission. If you have photographs, sketches, documents you desire for the Commission to consider, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the City. Please provide to the Recording Secretary. The quasi-judicial proceeding will be conducted in accordance with the procedures adopted in Resolution Number 24-1997. Recording Secretary, have all persons wishing to speak signed an oath card? If not, anyone wishing to speak must submit a signed oath card at this time. You have oath cards? I don't have any. No. Okay. Make sure if you want to speak that you fill out your oath card and submit it. Uh, staff, have all public hearings agenda items been properly advertised? Has any commission member visited the site or spoken to any member of the public regarding a quasi-judicial item? Uh, I'll ask you that in, further in a minute. In the event that a member has received an ex parte communications, verbal, written, or electronic identity of the person with whom the communication took place, and the subject of the communication must be disclosed, including opinions, facts, disclosed. Any written communications must be a part of the record. The site visits must be disclosed as well. Uh, as I see it, and correct me, uh, staff or attorney, uh, new business item A, the vacation is a quasi-judicial item. The one on Chester Drive is a quasi-judicial item. The fuel tanks upgrade is a quasi-judicial item. And the Brooks Landing uh, sketch plat is a quasi-judicial item. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Pardon? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the others on the agenda are not. So, uh, again, has anyone uh, spoken to... Uh, or visit the site or had any communications on any of those items. Okay. Uh, I will disclose, I inquired from uh, staff about the status of JJ Road uh, on Monday. Uh, I followed up by contacting the Bavard County Planning Department uh, as far as whether or not JJ Road was a local street, a, a connector, collect, collector, or an arterial. Uh, they advised me today that it's a local road, local street. I likewise uh, communicated based upon the uh, reference that uh, staff gave me with the St. John's Water Management District as far as the status of the permitting on Brooks Landing and uh, received uh, information from them that the only information I received there had been an earlier application which was administratively I guess withdrawn uh, certainly the applicant can bring us up to date on those kinds of issues so moving on to the first item mr. chairman Yes. I think we've got to approve the minutes. Yes, we do. Thank you, sir. I, uh, regarding the minutes of the regular meeting, there are two things uh, I would point out. On page 9 of 10, uh, my name is spelled wrong. All right. Uh, on the third item, Member Richardson said the term forfeit should not have been used in regard to Mr. Bobbitt's resignation. My name is misspelled. And on page 10, as I recall, you asked the about the River Palms be put on this agenda? Yes, sir. I don't see it on the agenda. It's not on the agenda. Uh, my plan was to bring it up under my report. Okay. So I would make a motion that the minutes for the regular meeting of July 8th be approved with that noted exception of the spelling of my name. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, forgive me for interrupting. There are a few changes that I, uh, staff would like to discuss as well to the minutes. Um, they were noticed uh, after publication of the agenda. Okay. If you'll, uh, sure. I've included it in the Agenda Star program under um, the document called Staff Edits PNZ Minutes. 
Um, the page two has uh, two changes, uh, the mis uh, misspelling of my last name as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, on the fourth paragraph down, um, we are inserting the word said after my name. Um, it was just omitted. Um, on page five, um, the last sentence of the first paragraph there, uh, we are inserting at the end of inches or after inches of existing tree, uh, of existing trees, that is, and changing the word multiple to multiply. Page six, the third paragraph, um, the word incite is misspelled. Um, and the word it should be if in the middle of the page. And then on page nine, um, Miss Farr's last name is misspelled. Um, and under reports, we are replacing the word said after Chairman Sievers to mentioned and uh, adding presentation item after participation guide, and we are adding a missing E to the word requested after my name, and that's all. Gabriel Margaret Cooper would be proud of you. She was a city clerk for I don't know how long, <laughs> 40 years ago. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Richardson, would you like to um, uh, renew your motion with those uh, further additions? Yes. I make my, a motion that we approve the regular minutes of the meeting of July 8th as amended. Is there a second? Second. Do we have a second? Uh, any further discussion? If not, uh, we will have uh, all those in favor, please say yes. 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 All, all those opposed, no? Okay, they pass. Then we've got the... Pardon? Then we have the special meeting. The minutes of the special meeting. Right. We have the special meeting minutes. Mr. Richardson, you have a motion on that one? Yeah. I would move <laughs> approval of the, if Gabriel doesn't correct me, <laughs> the, minutes, the minutes of the special meeting of July the 8th, 2020. Do we have, do we have a second? I second. Do we have a second? Uh, all those in favor, please say yes. Yes. As opposed, no. Okay. Are we ready to uh, go forward with item number nine, new business uh, A? Uh, hearing nothing else, I uh, will proceed with EAS uh, number 2-2020, excuse me, 2545 Christopher Drive, uh, a vacation. Yes, sir. Thank Staff. you, sir. Um, this request is an easement vacation along Christopher Drive, um, a property along Christopher Drive. Um, it is a single family lot um, and they, the applicant is requesting to vacate the north uh, five feet of, the, of a 25 foot wide public utility and drainage easement um, in order to accommodate the construction of a screen porch extension. There were no objections raised by any of the utility companies or um, city departments, and staff is recommending approval of this request. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Uh, do we have any cards on this item? No, sir. Uh, not seeing any cards. Is there uh, any discussion? If I don't hear discussion, is there a motion? But, I you move to accept item EAS number 2-2020, 2545 Christopher Drive. Second. And we have a second. Any discussion on the motion to approve or recommend approval? Not hearing any. Uh, does have a roll call? Member Grant? Yes. 
Secretary Spidell? Yes. Member Murray? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Member Porter? Yes. Chairman Sievers? Yes. Turning to item B, uh, EAS number 1-2020-5778. Uh, Cheshire Drive, again a vacation of a portion of uh, an easement. Uh, staff? Thank you, sir. Okay. It's right there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is another request as the chairman said, to vacate a portion of an easement along the rear of a single-family lot. Um, in this case, the applicant is proposing to construct a swimming pool with a screen enclosure, and the applicant would like to vacate uh, five feet of the uh, top portion of the 10-foot wide public utility and drainage easement. There were no objections raised by any of the local utility companies or city departments and staff is recommending approval of this request. Thank you. Do we have any cards for the public hearing? No, sir. Return this back to the commission. Do we have discussion by the commission? Anyone like to make a motion? I would make, I would make a motion that we recommend approval for EA, EAS number one twenty twenty. 5778 Cheshire Drive. Do we have a second to the motion? Second. And we have a second for the motion. Any discussion on the motion? Not hearing any. Uh, roll call. I apologize. I missed that. Pardon? I missed the motion and who seconded. Motion I and Mr. Second. Yeah. Member Spidell? Yes. Member Porter? Yes. Member Murray? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Member Grant? Yes. Chairman Sievers? Yes. Thank you. Item C, CUP number 1 2020 fuel tanks upgrade and review conditional use permit number 1 2020 and make a recommendation to the City Council. The Environmental Commission considered this CUP on July 15th and it's scheduled for City Council agenda July 28th. What was TEC's recommendation? TEC recommended approval. Okay. All right, staff, your report. Thank you, sir. Uh, the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit for storage. Um, of a regulated substance within the area of critical concern um, and is proposing to replace an existing underground fuel storage tank with two, I'm sorry, two existing underground, excuse me, tanks with one above ground tank along Flake Road. Um, the facility is owned by Brevard County and is used to fuel um, uh, all county owned vehicles. Um, the uh, fueling has taken place at the site since 1968. Uh, existing fuel tanks have been on the site since 1989. Uh, current underground fuel tanks within the 500 foot radius of a, an existing well in the area of critical concern will be removed. Uh, the new replacement tank will be outside of the 500-foot radius, but within the 750-foot setback of a well. Um, the uh, well field protection operating permit application has been submitted to the city, and uh, tank design and location are consistent with FDEP regulations, and staff is recommending approval of this request. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Not hearing any. Do we have any cards on this item? Yes, sir. Christine Fallier? Yes. She also has a handout. Can, do you want me to take that? Good evening. I'm Christine Vallier, Assistant County Attorney for Brevard. Um, 
thank you for hearing our application this evening. Uh, we were here last Wednesday, as staff said, before the TEC, and they unanimously recommended approval. Um, in addition to the information that staff provided you to introduce this item, I, I wanted to add that the county has owned this property since the late 1940s. There have been a variety of uses on the property and currently are multiple uses on the property. It's a road and bridge storage and maintenance facility, um, currently a fleet fueling service facility, and also animal shelter um, services are all on this same site. The county, part of the county's request is a variance of 200.38 uh, feet from the 750 foot setback for um, location near an active well in the area of critical concern. The new tank will be located further away from well 24 towards the eastern portion of the county property. It'll be at least 500 feet away and the first, the large diagram that I handed out is the setback for the new tank location. This new location is consistent with DEP setback requirements for wellhead protection areas and is also consistent with the Titusville Comprehensive Land Use Plan, specifically Conservation Element Policy 1.13.6 which states that the city shall adhere to the FDEP wellhead protection standards in Florida Administrative Code Rule 62-521. And that code defines um, the wellhead protection area as that distance of 500 feet around a potable water well. The modern tank will um, provide a double wall design and extensive leak protection system and it will greatly increase protection of the well field area over what is currently there. Um, and it'll prevent uh, migration off site and migration of any contaminants towards well 24. So it actually will provide greater protection in the well field area. I handed out, there were some questions at the TEC meeting last week about the specific design of the tank. So we got this handout here for you from the um, contractor. So you can see that it is um, very elaborate and well designed to provide the current standards of leak detection and contamination protection. The county, this is the last of the um, county facilities of underground storage tank fuel facilities to be upgraded to above ground facilities. The this is a purely preventative measure. There's no leak detection. There's no um, DEP action for any state violation going on. This is completely to perform preventative maintenance um, and provide the uh, latest technology and in protection. This property is zoned for public use and is surrounded on three sides by property for public use, specifically the Arthur John Airport. To the north of the county facility is vacant property and property used for warehousing. There are three locations within a mile of the county facility that use above ground storage tanks and that is the last handout that I provided to you. There is um, the Titusville Fleet Fueling Station on Singleton Ave Avenue with a um, 10,000 gallon tank for unleaded gas and another 10,000 tank for diesel fuel, both are above ground storage tanks. There's also above ground storage tanks at the airport itself, 10,000, actually two 10,000 gallon storage tanks for aviation fuel. And then there, is, there are storage at the Morning Dove water treatment plant, the city facility, um, 6,000 gallon tank for diesel and another tank, um, 2,600 gallon for mineral acid, both above ground storage tanks. The county's CUP application is consistent with the character of the surrounding area. The only change it is that we are upgrading the fuel tank to modern technology and we're moving it further away from wellhead 24. 
City staff has reviewed the county's application thoroughly and determined that it meets the requirements of the city's hazardous material technical manual and city requirements both in the code and in the comp plan. As we said, TEC unanimously approved or recommended approval of the county's application. I have um, the county's experts here to answer any questions that you may have. We have Carl Kotner, the Brevard County Fleet Service Manager, Tom Mulligan, the engineer who prepared the Emergency Management and Contingency Report, and Josh Giz with JSR Fueling Technologies, who is the contractor providing um, the tank and the installation services. I'd just like to reserve some time after the presentation. Yes. Uh, and could you just flip back to the chart before? I guess it was one more back from there where it talked about how many feet away. It's 500 feet away. And it's, it's more than 550 feet away. 550? Yes. Excellent. That was my only question. Any other questions of the applicant? Thank you. Thank you. Just ask for your support of the county's application. Thanks. Any other cards? No, sir. Any uh, questions by the commission of uh, staff? Yes. Commissioner. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I can't see you. So <laughs> any, uh, anyone have any questions? Uh, do we have a motion? My motion to accept um, resolution 1, 2020 on full fuel tank upgrades and a commendation that this is a pre preventive measure. measure. So and that includes approval of the conditional use permit. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Do we have a second to the motion? Second. Any discussion on the motion? We'll have a roll call. Secretary Spidell? Yes. Member Murray? Yes. Member Grant? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Member Porter? Yes. Chairman Severs? Yes. The, the next item of business, we turn to item D, Brooks Landing Sketch Plat. Uh, the recommended action is approval of the Spetz plat for Brooks Landing Subdivision staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a moment, please. The item before you is the Brooks Landing uh, sketch plat. Um, it is located along JJ Road in the north side of the city, um, approximately 1,000 feet east of US Highway 1. The, prox the uh, property is approximately 71 acres and consists of several lots. Um, it is proposed to be 143 single family uh, lots, as is allowed by the uh, plan development ordinance. The land use underlying the zoning is residential two. The zoning district is plan development and it has a master plan that was approved uh, back in 2019 with the plan development. This is a, a copy of the master plan that was approved with the ordinance. And it's almost identical to the sketch plat. Uh, there, are, there is one difference between the two, and it's this. This doesn't work. But um, the cul-de-sac 
at the northeast corner has been shortened uh, to meet the requirement of the uh, the ordinance, the PD ordinance. So whereas before it uh, was longer, it's been shortened to reduce asphalt. Um, and it is consistent in the opinion of staff with the approved PZ, uh, PD zoning uh, master plan and it meets the city's sketch plat requirements. And the next step would be the preliminary plat um, once the sketch plat is approved by city council. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any question by the commission? Yes, member. What is the density? So I went online, read all the permits, all that good stuff. Couldn't really tell because I didn't have this particular piece to lay over the top of the permit. What's the density of this compared to the houses that surround it? Um, the houses that surround it are approximately one acre, but, or one home per acre, or mm -hmm. one acre lots. Um, but it is somewhat similar in the sense that you only have two homes per acre. Um, with the, the residential to land use, uh, but um, in a sense, it's it's a little more condensed uh, because you're preserving the the other areas surrounding the lots. So around is R one then. Um, that the the surrounding areas are within the um, county, but I believe the north of it, it's residential too. Um, I can chime in, Gabriel. So, yeah, most of it is in unincorporated Brevard County. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the land use is residential too. Most of the properties are actually being used at a lesser density, but the maximum density is residential too, which is two acres per unit. Right. Two acres per unit. Yeah, sorry. Two units per acre, excuse me. Two, I was going to say. Yeah, two. two and now you've got. <laughs> My head was kind of spinning going, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so around most of them are not at that density but in this case they're looking for two per acre correct when the land use was approved it was approved to be similar to what was surrounding as far as comprehensive plan land use okay. and so their proposed number of residential lots will be at that maximum okay any other questions by other Commission members Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Grant. Um, when I was reading up on this, um, please bear with me here because I'm new to this. Um, I thought I read somewhere where the commission denied the PD back in June. So the rezoning portion of it was recommended for denial, uh, but the city council then approved. Okay. Subject to conditions. And so you're recommending approval now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, at this point, the, the rezoning lies over the property already. So um, what's before you now for approval or approval with conditions or denial is the uh, sketch plat, which is the it's the first step in the planning process. OK, All right. I'm just making some clarification. Bear with me. Sure, sure. No problem. Any other questions? Yes, members. Um, I had. On the information that um, Brad sent out today on, um, what was that, an environmental study? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tremendous percentage, and I don't know how much, was ponded, indicate the, the land ponded. <clears throat> how much water is that? What does that mean? What percentage then of that almost 57 acres is ponded? P O N D E D. Can you point to us what you're referring to? I, Where, did you I said bring from the that? study? Yeah. It was in the soil areas. It was a sand fact. Factors of They were just going sand. through and explaining that in certain areas it ponds. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I would say in maybe 85% of the 57 acres. Does that mean that there's not adequate drainage in those lots? I'm not sure that I could comment on that. I'd, I'd have to defer to whomever made this report. 
either way, they're going to have to provide, show the engineering during the preliminary plant stage, yeah. whether they can meet the stormwater requirements. Okay. And it, I mean, it says here on page, a few pages in here, it talks about wetlands, excuse me, um, the amount of compensatory mitigation required, uh, or that, I'm not sure that's referring to ponding, but whatever they're, what they're proposing you here tonight has to be engineered. And so that has to be demonstrated through the site plan process, which is the next stage. Okay. If they can't, then they're going to have to redesign or probably make this less intense. Can you define another term, H-Y-D-R-I-C, hydric? It was under sand factors. I took notes from, from the computer. I didn't print it out. It would um, be under sand factors. Sand factors. Uh-huh. What conditions exist when the land does not meet, meet hydric criteria was my question after reading it. I would only assume that that means the, uh, how the land drains, but that's just an assumption. I, I don't know. Wow. And then my, my other question was what percentage of this land would require fill? Only that that's noted under wetlands, which is eight acres? Um, that would have to be determined by the engineer. So that would be second stage? Yes, ma'am. Was that a consideration the first time this appeared before this council? So it was considered before you was primarily a land use question. Right, I remember that And so that the master part, yeah. plan, it provided much more detail than we probably typically would find with a concept plan attached to a PD ordinance. Okay. Um, so the, the really the test is going to be the engineering stage to see if this can be really done. But as far as a land use perspective, that first review that came before you was to see whether it was this only on was compatibility. Use, okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, my other question was now looking at the platting, had there been a question on at road access within that development? That was discussed during the land use stage and the rezoning stages, yes. And we've also discussed that with uh, the applicant as far as the sketch plat, but primarily what we did with the sketch plat stage is to make sure it was consistent with what was approved with the zoning with that okay. master plan. Did, did, was it ever discussed that an awful lot of these roads were just kind of going around and then exiting up to US-1? Is that, that's where it's going, is that correct? But if you're talking about the number of vehicles coming in and out? Yeah, okay, yeah, so, it's exactly. Yes, yeah, so our understanding is that, that will, the, they'll go out west towards US-1 as a main means of going in and out of this property. Was correct? it ever discussed in the preliminary, when we were talking about preliminaries, that it looked like an awful lot of vehicles were going out one road? I think the minutes um, of the council meeting at the very least reflect that there were some concerns from members of the public uh, with regard to the state of those roads and the c uh, capacity of those roads. So that's already been discussed? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm not Is that going to be discussed again? So a traffic study was submitted to us at that time. And so yeah. it was evaluated as to what the impact would be. And it was determined not to to exceed our concurrency standards and not to be a, a significant um, need for improvement along that roadway and intersection. Okay, thank you. thank you, thank you. Mr. Richardson. The two main issues <clears throat> that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended denial were one, exactly what you said. Okay. Because the road that it cons is right on uh, JJ Road is a county road, correct? Not a arterial street within the city of Titusville, and that, in our opinion, violated the comp plan. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there was w only one point of ingress and egress mm -hmm. for a subdivision consisting of 143 lots, Thank you. we said there should be two, and hopefully one out to US one. Those were there were a lot of underlying reasons, but those were the two main reasons uh, for uh, denial of this project. May I add to that? So Go ahead. when you're doing, when you're looking at that kind of a traffic study, when you're looking at 104 you know, homes, okay, 
what percentage of cars does everybody have 1.3 cars or, or is there a, a figure you use for that? Sure, everybody the goes to work at 830 and there are 1.3 cars times 104 coming in there, and out at approximately the same time study. Yes, ma'am. And they, they and that's just fine. Well, we, I mean, we base what the traffic engineer and the study that we get well, at that time, we did receive a traffic study that did analyze uh, the number of vehicle trips that might be generated based on this type of use um, and at certain times of days, at times of the day as well. And then it also came to a recommendation conclusion as to what that impact might have on the local roads there and going out to US-1. And the conclusions that we saw in that study was that it was not going to be an impact, especially to our concurrency standards. Was there any mention of school bus routing in that particular area of the 104 lower cost houses? No. There are going to be babies there. Not to our knowledge. I'm not sure that that's included. And was in there the any discussion of emergency vehicles? Okay. So the fire department did look at this because we do have standards as far as how many access points you must have depending on how many units you have. And so they looked at this as a, if you see the entrance of this development, the boulevard. So their biggest concern is going to be, can one side of that road be blocked? If the road, the only access point is blocked off, how are they going to get into the other development? Well, if the boulevard standard or boulevard style, one part, one of those lanes can be blocked up. They still can get into the development through the other one. So they didn't have any objection to what you see here, and that's why that rezoning was approved. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Berkey, do you have anything? Pardon? Okay. Uh, any other uh, commissioners have questions of staff? Okay. Uh, let's, uh, do we have any cards on this? No, sir. No cards. I, I, I know you represent the <laughs> do, do you want to speak? Uh, sure. <laughs> you, after you speak, you'll need to sign one of those oath cards. Okay. Good evening, Chairman, Commission members. My name is Chad Janoni. I'm with AG Ventures, the applicant, and um, just ask that you approve our request tonight. We've worked with staff over a little over a year now from the time we had the approval from City Council to address all the comments and come up with the plan that you have in front of you tonight. And um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Member Murray. Good evening. My question has to do with um, you have the area with, it looks like one, two, three, four internal areas. Will those be treed, grassed? Um, what are those going to be comprised of? Um, uh, the open space areas? Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be some trees. We're trying to preserve some trees in some of the areas, but I don't know exactly at this point. Okay. If, um, uh, let me see if I can tell. Do you know which ones you're specifically you're talking about? No. <laughs> okay. we just, we've been having quite a conversation recently about making sure that we take care of native vegetation and trees and a few of those things. And whenever I see places like that, I love to strongly encourage yeah. the developers to... Uh, well, we, we do have some trees on the perimeter areas that we were trying to preserve. Um, I don't know if they fall within the common area. There's, there's a couple just like common area tracks. I'm not sure if they do fall within those areas. But to the extent we can, we, we try to. Okay. If I might call your attention to the tree survey uh, on page 185, um, that will show you, of the agenda that is, that will show you all of the existing 20 inch trees. So this isn't a full tree survey including six inch trees, but, um, and there are a few in those open areas that you were inquiring about. Any other commissioners have any questions? I have a, a few questions. Uh, what percentage uh, of common open space are you setting aside? Oh, I might have to defer to staff on that. I know we met the requirements, but. Well, my follow-up question to, to that is, I would like to see on the 
plan itself, uh, what is included, and, and what page should I be looking at? What is included in the common open space? Um, so that'll be page 181. And under site information, you'll see uh, tracks B, E, and G are included as common open space. And the total percentage is 37.7% of the site. Okay, are any of the retention ponds included within that? Yes, sir. Let me try to pull that up. Uh, and what amenities are in that, those retention ponds to have them being classified as uh, common open recreation, uh, parks and uh, open space? Um, we, the, so part of it was required by the ordinance, but in uh, track G, there's a, there are two park benches proposed, one on the north side of that um, uh, stormwater area and one on the south side. There's a five foot wide concrete jogging trail proposed on the eastern side of that, uh, connecting to the uh, sidewalks. Um, there is also a jogging trail proposed on the northeast site with uh, terminating in a park bench. Um, there is a pavilion proposed south of Tract E with a fountain in the middle. Well, as I understand you, some of these uh, retention ponds ha within the pond itself have no amenities other than their uh, retention ponds. There are some amenities around them, is that correct? That's right. Uh, uh, frankly, this gets back, Gabriel, before your time <laughs> to uh, numerous discussions as to how in the world, under the language of the ordinance, you can count those as park and and meeting the open space requirements. In my opinion, again, I don't see where they meet it. If you want to count the strip where you have the jogging trail and where the benches are, fine. Uh, because whether the whole purpose of the PD ordinance is to be uh, different and additional amenities over and above that that you would have in a regular subdivision the regular subdivision, you're still going to have to have retention bonds. And even dead ending some of these um, uh, trails into the very front part of a uh, wetlands or another area, and then counting the entire area, I frankly do not see that it meets the requirement uh, of the code. Um, turning away from that for the moment, on 185, the language says, and I have to, it's very hard to read <laughs> the stuff. <laughs> Which one are you sir? Yes. Is that the tree survey, sir? Yes. Okay. The developer agrees to work with staff and adjust the proposed layout to preserve more trees and specifically to preserve mitigation sized trees. Uh, either one of you, staff or the applicant, what adjustments did you make in your plan to preserve more trees? Well, at the time, I mean, there. We, we might have moved the road, maybe some lots at the time, I mean. My question is, did you? I mean, I see, I don't see any no. adjustment from the original plan when there was not a tree survey to this plan where there is a tree survey and you're the 20 well, inches in diameter and above trees, they're gonna be bulldozed out in this entire area. It's not going to have 
where, where the houses are located and the streets are located and where the retention ponds are located, there'll be nothing. So how did you adjust <laughs> your layout to preserve more trees, which is a code requirement as such? Well, it, there, I think there may be some instances where lots, where they're on the edge of lots, maybe between lots, we can use tree wells to preserve those trees. You know, that was sort of, I think, kind of the idea is as we get further along, maybe there's some opportunity for that. It's, well, it's something the, the we've done. The problem for me as a commissioner, this is the only time I will see this project. Right. I will not see it preliminary plat. So I have to make my input and comments today because beyond that, we, we have no input to the process, which I've already complained about the, the process I don't think is appropriate. Okay. And you're familiar with other jurisdictions, you go through the Planning and Zoning Commission at preliminary plat stage. That's common as such. Okay. In, in addition, I mean, we have a code section that requires section 30-324A where you're supposed to preserve 10% of the native vegetation. Where is that on this plan? Well, I know we're preserving quite a bit of area, you know, in the middle, in the middle area. I don't know. I'm not counting wetlands. Okay. Wetlands, as I understand from staff, wetlands don't count. Right. They're already preserved because you're not supposed to disturb the area. Right. So where, I see nothing on here where you're, and this is the time I should ask this question, where is it on the drawing that you're preserving 10% Native vegetation and trees. Mr. Chairman, if I may ask yeah. the applicant, what was this property used for prior to your it purchase? It was an orange grove. It was an abandoned grove, basically, yeah. It wasn't so much there. What, what vegetation can you tell us that is on this property? There's some burnout trees and there's there's a fair I think there's some pepper trees a lot of invasives at this point but mainly burnout trees I mean that's the bulk of it we're another question so the orange grove why was it that um, I, my understanding is that at one point there was pretty heavily wooded with a lot of orange trees but a lot of them are gone now correct <clears throat> and why is that do you know well they just died out and they weren't maintained and and basically that that it just stopped uh, May I add something? I think that particular grove may have died in that freeze in uh, the 70s. Is that correct? Probably 81. 80, yes. Maybe. Yes. I don't yeah, know the history really that far freeze. back. I'd like to add from the environmental study that you've got three acres of hardwood. But from the environmental study and from the plat, I can't figure out where that hardwood is. The other stuff is just kind of trash. Up trees. around that corner Lots there. of pepper trees, yeah. and, and you've already that, stipulated that. The, what would be the north, um, actually it's a fairly nice wetland, it's a, it's a wooded wetland, that, that may be what you're discussing, and there is some lands around there that's outside of the wetlands that we are preserving. If you look at that large area where uh, just to the right of the cul-de-sac, which is the northeast, I'd say that's you know, four or five acres, and, and a lot of that is the forested wetland It's area. three, yeah, three acres of hardwood. Oh, the, yeah, and then, but that whole area probably is a little more than that. It could I be. think our concern is, as we've looked at things with the tree ordinance, proposed tree ordinance, is that we're going to see a hundred and some houses with little crepe myrtles planted <laughs> beside the garage. And you're shaking your head yes. No, I, I'm, I hear what you're saying. Oh, okay. That's all I was I, I hear what you're saying. Right, but you're planning the crepe myrtles? I, you know, <laughs> no. This is, that's what, what I'm saying. Okay. I, I, that's a and point we're also taking. saying, where is the preservation of native vegetation? Well, the na what would we call the native at that point? Native, well, not the it, pepper trees. I'll give gross? you that. Like burnout growth trees, or like, I mean, would we say that is worthy of preserving if it's dead? You only have three acres 
that have been stipulated as having even hardwood on them. Okay. Of a hundred and some houses. Is this going to look like a hundred and four houses with a Lowe's or Home Depot crate myrtle planted beside the garage? <laughs> no. That's not the plan, no, no. What is the plan? I, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean, I, I, I believe there's, you know, I, I don't we, don't, we haven't gone that far to see how we're going to plant each lot at this stage of it, but. My concern is the same as Chairman Sievers. I understand. Yes. I, one, one thing um, that I, I'd like to clarify, um, because it, we're at the sketch plat stage, we don't have a full tree survey right now. Right. And we don't have a full understanding right now of where where that 10% would be because the areas of former orange grove and if there were pepper trees interspersed all along there, they would have to surgically remove those and then propose native plantings that are consistent with that habitat, what existed there, um, which is mostly scrub and uh, wetland. But um, if I might propose that this uh, commission could recommend that the front yard trees at the preliminary plat stage, once we receive our landscape plans, be native trees um, as a, a suggestion. That's a good suggestion. I, I am still then going back to the sand factors in this ponding. I think what you've got is a lot of wetlands, a lot of damp basements here without the basement. Commissioner Murr. Um, I have a couple questions. First of all, where would this fall under the tree ordinance? The existing one, correct, and not the future, because they're in the process. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And based on the fact that this was, and I read the study that you talked about today, and they were pretty clear there's not a lot of trees that are worthwhile on this property. Under the ordinance that they would be dealing with, we've always talked about when you cut down a tree of a certain size, then you replace it with a tree times two or three or four. If there's not a tree, what happens? What do you mean if there's not a tree? Well, there, if there's not a tree, and what you would you do your calculation based on, then you have to rely on canopy, right? So it's not like I have a heritage oak that's sitting there that's 34 inches and if I have to take it down then I'm going to do my multiplication and figure out how many trees oh, I'm right. planting and mm -hmm. replacement of because there just isn't a tree. How does that work? Um, is there another part of the ordinance that I'm unfamiliar with that says if it's just plain land then you're required to put so many inches of trees and native habitat back? So if it's plain land, we do not require, we obviously we wouldn't require mitigation, but we do require the planting of the 10% uh, area. So if, if there is insufficient vegetation there, then they would have to plant with native vegetation consistent with that habitat or what was there, um, that area. It, it just brings up an interesting point as far as, again, this is an well, old. If I could, I'll just read the, sec the, the code section. 30-324, all single-family residential lots or developments shall preserve an area of approved low and moderate tolerant water usage mixed vegetation, native, trees and shrubs are preferred, equal to at least 10% of the total lot or development area. In the event there are no approved low and moderate tolerant water usage mixed vegetable on a lot or development, the applicant shall be required to establish an area of approved low and moderate uh, plantings. You know, to me, this is the time on the sketch plat you see where this is going to be located. And yes, this was a former orange grove, but on page 185, I see a lot of oak trees in the middle of lots, on streets, etc., uh, more than 20 inches in diameter uh, that are going to be uh, bulldozed out. I mean, that's what the drawings show. And that's the reason why I'm asking the question is, 
Did staff require them to redesign it? Did the applicant redesign it any to try to save some of the existing major trees, that is trees in excess of 20 inches in diameter, or not? Because that's what the code uh, simply says. Uh, I guess the next question I have, where is the outfall for this project? Well, I believe at this point it's it's going to the north and ultimately, I'm sorry, to the east, to the northeast. Well, will any of it be going out towards JJ Road? I do not believe it will be okay. at this point. That, that's what I understand to be true at this point. It may be just going more towards the east. Well, staff did provide me and I thank staff for doing that, a, the stormwater management study. Is that a recent one or is that one from 2000? Uh, this is, a, I believe it's a recent one. It's uh, dated uh, January 2020. Okay, okay. And um, one thing is clear from this report is ultimately the water from this project goes to the Indian River. Okay. It clearly states that. Okay. And uh, I realize the design com probably complies with a 25-year, 24-hour pre-post uh, requirements. We seem to have a, a lot of storms that exceed the 25-year storm. And where does it all go? In this instance, it's going to go to the Indian River and we already have enough problems. Uh, on these lots, individual lots, which are around 6,000 square feet, what percentage of that lot has impervious surface? I don't think it can be more than, I don't know those numbers. Actually, I don't know, but. I think it's in the one Yeah, there's a, there's a requirement. It's not gonna exceed the percentage. I think it's 50, 60%. Yeah, so it would be less than that. Or that. And if you got 143 times that, there is an awful lot of area <laughs> that there's going to be runoff. And most of this ultimate runoff is, according to this report, ends up in the Indian River, is where it goes. And that's another concern that I have. I mean, one of the things that is required to be shown on the sketch plan is the legal positive outfall. So, uh, staff, you satisfied you see the legal positive outfall? Um, that was reviewed by the city engineer, but it should be in the, oh gosh, where's the agenda here? Sorry. If you give us a moment, see if we can locate that. But I know okay. that, that was something that we did identify here. Yes. Looking at this on the computer, it's very hard yes. to read these plans. That's why when we review them, we, we <laughs> print out large sheets sometimes. It should be a separate sheet. Mr. Chairman, I do want to mention or just respond to some of the comments about the open space. This was one of those projects that was brought before City Council where they asked us to do or re revisit our open space ordinance. Right. So because of this project, because of the definitions that you see that you've mentioned about um, what qualifies as open space for PD, for example, inside our code, uh, City Council asked us to address that and come up, tighten our definitions basically in our criteria. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, the other thing, too, is that as far as the 10% native vegetation, um, assuming this might be a scenario where there's no, that vegetation doesn't exist and they have to plant it, they have a 50-foot wide buffer around these lots right now. That goes way above and beyond our current minimum of 20 feet. So that is an opportunity where they can do planting in addition to what we would require in our standard code for a uh, buffer. Uh, buffer. So it's, a, yes, ma'am. Um. And where this comes right. into play, I'm not quite sure, but we have, you know, this email from a resident. Yes, ma'am. Who has concerns about that. Um, 
And based on what that resident's saying, it's not a true 50 foot buffer. So uh, I think the resident believes that a buffer is to be fully forested, and our requirement is not that. Our buffers, our buffers are four canopy trees per 200 linear feet of buffer. And so you'll multiply that by however many linear feet. Um, and so this is an opportunity, if they were to forest that some more with the 10% required, if there isn't an area that they can preserve to further uh, screen that. Um, okay. She was concerned about the pool um, encroaching in the buffer. The pool, as the PD ordinance allows, can only encroach or can only be within the rear 20 foot setback, uh, but cannot go into that additional 50 foot buffer. Okay. okay anyone else uh, have any questions of the applicant? Yes. Since you're the applicant, you certainly have uh, a time to rebut or express what um, you would like, sir. I have no further comments. I'm, I'm just here to answer any questions. I just have a couple quick comments. One is, again, just because we're going through all this comprehensive plan stuff and going through all those details, I'm really confused, and this is a great point of clarification on open space, because again, where I come from, 143 houses actually has a park, <laughs> not a two benches and a Mountain. Where in the code is that definition of how that open space can be used? Because again, going back to our list earlier, now the good news is, is you're already in the process and some of these things that we're talking about won't apply, but it concerns me that you're now going to put 143 houses in that area and there just doesn't seem to be, in my mind, a normal situation for true open recreation area. So can you help me with so how that's defined? For the first question about where in the code, um, I'd like to point you to section 30-163. Um, F3, um, and I'll read it aloud. Uh, common open space includes both passive recreation, example given picnic areas or walking trails, and active recreation, example given uh, playgrounds or basketball court areas. Private water bodies and stormwater retention or detention areas that are designed to be used for passive recreation, specifically improved with fountains, benches, and walkways. Uh, may be counted towards the common open space minimum requirement. So that's what's allowing that. Yeah, and again, when I go back to the core of what the comp plan is saying, bear with me, it is really trying to drive towards we need parks. And I was under the impression that we were going to encourage developers that they would be providing parks. And so I sometimes worry about the definition that you just gave that, you know, you put in a little trail and you throw in a couple benches and <laughs> we're good to go. I don't know that it applies where we are tonight, but going back to what we talked about earlier with these things that we want to look at, I think that's one of the things that we really need to look at is understanding from a comp plan and then moving forward, how we're defining some of these things such as those open spaces. Again, I'm pro-business. I want them to develop, but I want them to develop neighborhoods that are enriching to the quality of our life. And we have 143 homes kind of out there. There's, I guess, Parish is kind of close by, you know. <laughs> Get on a bike and do your multimodal down US-1 and go to Parish. And I'm just concerned. And again, what we have today, it sounds like they've met all the requirements of today, even what's appropriate to the sketch plan. We have a little bit of a hole because we don't see the next phase. They've got a tree survey, they've got all this kind of stuff. It just is a challenge for us if we're going to move forward with some of our comp plan stuff, that this is a good example of things that challenge us. May I respond? 
So what you're referring to is this, the new comprehensive plan that we're going to present to you later this evening. Okay, so it's not about the current comprehensive plan, what you're referring to. Um, the, uh, we did try to work with Mr. Denoni on, on trying to include some more amenities when we first did the, talked about the plan development rezoning and the master plan attached to it. And I think this is the, really the best we were able to get based on the definitions we had in the code. We tried to incorporate recreational amenities of some sort. You're taking away people's backyards with small lots. You should provide something in return. So that's what we tried to, to argue. And we, I think we got what we could based on what the code said. However, um, at the time, the commission or the city council could have imposed you know, or asked for more. I mean, that is certainly right. Um, and hopefully we'll get back to you with a, a, a draft open space uh, ordinance that clearly defines what the city is really looking for. Um, as far as tonight, you do have the ability to work with the developer to maybe add a little bit more if possible to this sketch plan as part of before in order for approval to get to the next stage. That could include, for example, going back to native vegetation, planting that in certain areas. There you are required to put in a much larger buffer than our current code requires. Um, there could be some opportunity you could ask the applicant to maybe incorporate additional recreational amenities, possibly, in certain areas. Um, that's, you have that ability to make that recommendation. I don't think you're hamstrung on that because of the sketch plot process. Well, based upon the, uh, the definition that was just read about uh, utilizing retention ponds, track B, and tracked, I don't know whether it's G or, there's nothing in the ponds whatsoever. There's a bench around it, a walk around, and there, there's no fountains or docks or other amenities at all that I see even meets our current definition suggested requirements. So in my mind, those need to be excluded and not counted as common open space because they don't meet the current code. Now, certainly track E, it has a fountain, and it says it's common open space, but there's nothing at all. They're just retention bonds. That's all they are. So uh, I don't see where it complies with the the code as far as the sketch plotting process. Does anyone else have any questions of the applicant? Could this be characterized as zero lot lines? Zero lot lines? Mm -hmm. No, ma'am. Um, this would not be because they, they still have uh, setbacks on either side. Am I not reading the feet? Help me out here. Um, this I, looks like 143 homes up next to each other. Right. So zero lot line would be basically absolutely no setbacks. Right. And houses. So how many be, feet is it set back, please? I, I, could, uh, I could tell you in just a minute. Okay. Um, the front yard is 20 feet. Side yards are five. Side corner yards are 10 and rear yards are 20. So the buildings would be 10 feet away from each other? Right. 10 feet. Yes, ma'am. I guess one, uh, I see that this development plan is a phase A and phase B. Is that correct? Correct. We likely will do it in one phase, but we had that option. Well, it, Assuming you uh, did phase A or B first, I, I, this is the question for you and the staff, do you meet the requirements? That, that is common open space, uh, et cetera, and uh, the 10% set aside, do you meet the requirements? Unfortunately, I've seen a number of projects, phase one got started, phase two never occurred, and we want to make sure that there's compliance with the code with each phase. I mean, in that instance, could we say that the remaining land would be 
open space for that period? <laughs> that that wouldn't fall under a, a, an undeveloped portion of the subdivision would not fall under um, open space. Okay. And just for clarification on that, so I think one of the concerns we have, especially as we've seen some of these pictures and stuff recently in meetings, is that you go in and in order to get your roads and stuff in, it gets bulldozed. Understand sewer lines, understand roads, understand all of that. Um, but then the decision is made that they're only going to market to a certain section. So for an extended period of time, you have this uh, really kind of naked land sitting over there. No tree on it. Um, no native vegetation on it. Not even any grass on it. Um, and that has been concerning to me because, again, it becomes a huge issue as far as some of the environmental stuff that we're trying to do. Um, so I, I don't know how in the world we prevent that from happening, but it's one of those things that just is concerning to a lot of our citizens. And when you have that many, 143, there's a good chance that something like that could potentially happen. And again, it's not that the code says it can't happen, that the ordinances prevent it from happening. It's just one of those things that concerns us. So recently we had um, a developer that came in and they met with the community around them and they came and they chatted with the commissioners and then they came back with a really great plan on their own that kind of addressed some of the concerns we had. It was not things that they had to have done. It was things that they were saying based on the input that we're hearing. Um, we'd like to resolve some of these on our own. So hint, hint. Well, <laughs> let me just say we did a fair amount, of, quite a bit of that. We met with the neighbors on, on occasions. We Staff was very, I mean, we had a lot, a good couple years on this and of doing that. So it's, this is not our first choice. I mean, we had more units, a lot different plans. So just so you know, there was a lot of that that went into this plan. Yeah, and it's not so much the lot size. It's, again, okay. more about um, being um, aggressive or assertive in acknowledging that uh, the importance of, again, those trees that are going in, the importance of making sure that we have recreational space that meets the needs. Um, and, again, it's not something that I'm saying I'm going to require. It's something right. that we're saying as a value in the city, we want to encourage people that are coming into it to, um, on their own, see what some of those, again, I kind of look at it as low-hanging fruit. Yeah, I can easily put in native plantings. I can easily put in a little bit bigger tree. I can do some of those things that, again, is kind of a good neighbor type thing. Um, we're kind of stuck when it comes to some of those things, because you've done your work, you've worked with the city. Again, it's it's where we want to go, and I don't know that there's anything that we can do to prevent this, except for if we were to sit down tonight and say, here are five conditions we'd really like you to meet, and I just don't know that this is the right setting to do that. Um, and then get those to the council and have the council accept those. But okay. my concern, again, is Little tiny, little tiny lots. <laughs> I just have to hear the window, and I automatically know <laughs> it's gotcha. Pavlovian at this point. <laughs> little tiny lots and loss of vegetation, and those type things that, again, from our perspective, are becoming really concerning to us. And we look at some of those recent developments, and boy, it sure looks like another park preserve. Let and me and ask, when, when does this, all the others said when they was going to be on council agenda, when is this on council agenda? July 28th. Okay, I didn't see that. <laughs> okay. Um, to address that concern about the amenities, one thing that the commission could recommend is that, uh, and I'm not trying to sway it one way or another, but that all of the amenity areas uh, if within a certain number of years they were not built, that they be built um, if that second phase never happens or. Okay, any other questions of the applicant? 
Do we have any more cards? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes. The, we found an answer to one of the other questions about the outfall, and that's on page 189 of your packet. The very 189, okay. Sorry. Northeast portion of the, of the site, top right corner of the, of the plan, you'll see it states legal positive outfall. Does that empty into uh, an existing drainage ditch, or where does it go? Is it a public uh, easement? Did, in other words, is, a, is there a right to drain there? <laughs> I believe that there would have had to have been made some kind of determination on that as far as this sketch plat. Um, fortunately, I don't have that answer for you right now, but as far as the sketch plat, it is reviewed by our engineer, okay. and so that information we don't bring this before you unless it meets all of our criteria, including the engineer's review of a sketch plaque. So this must have been approved or recognized as something that can be done and will have to be demonstrated, obviously, through the site plan process. Okay, any further uh, discussion by commission members? Yes, Joe. Um, in all due respect, for the three new members, you saw what we faced over a year ago. No answers from the applicant, answers from the staff for the applicant. There's not any commitment from the applicant to do the things we expected. When we first considered this, just answers from the staff. Okay, any other discussion? Yes. Surprise. <laughs> I just want to be clear. They have met all the criteria. Yes, ma'am. And that's one of the challenges I have is they've met all the criteria. And again, I'm pro-business and they've met all those check boxes. Whether it's what we like or not is the challenge. So unusual setbacks here. Looks sounds like we have typical 20 foot driveways for the one car to go on. We don't have an unusual widths of streets. We fire departments approved it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's been reviewed by all the departments. And everybody said yes. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me. I don't think it has met all the criteria. It has not met the criteria for open space. Yeah, my, my position is, or the staff's position is that it has met the criteria for open space. Um, that, that's what my Can answer Mr. is. Mr. Severs then help me understand that? <laughs> I guess it's a difference of opinion. <laughs> I read the code and see what it says, and certain amenities in my mind should be uh, within the stormwater ponds if they're going to count them at park and open space, and there's nothing. Other than, uh, other than a concrete and a bench. Right, and, and that's the minimum that the code requires. So that's why we consider that open space. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, again, you, you have this ability to be able to make a recommendation, recommendation to City Council motion to add additional amenities possibly. Should that be done tonight? <coughs> you, you, this Red, is why it's before you this evening. Because it's going to Council next Correct. week. I'm also concerned about drainage into the Indian River Lagoon. I don't think that this man has clarified that for me. So if your recommendation is to design Clarify. in such a different way, then that would be a condition that you're recommending to City Council to address stormwater a little bit differently for this property because of its unique circumstance and unique location. That's something you could suggest to City Council. And so that would probably require, if that's approved by city council, that would probably mean you have to look, consider that during the preliminary plat stage, the site plan stage, and the engineering is going to have to reflect that. And that means that's a completely different, I would think, stormwater system than what you see here this evening. 
Okay, so the situation would be is if I voted, I approved it with conditions. The situation with what now, sorry? So I, I would approve, but with conditions. Yes, ma'am. You may make that motion. specify the conditions. Right. You would specify each condition. A new, a new engineering study that assures the amount of drainage into the, I mean, I, I don't know how to phrase that. What thing you could, well, if you, I think the question here, for example, uh, legal positive alpha, do you not accept that as acceptable? I mean, you see that as possibly going into some, or not draining or allowing for draining to go to the Indian River Lagoon. That means that they're probably going to have to um, <laughs> maintain all that stormwater on site. And I'm which is still, a different I'm still hung up on the word ponded. You know, I don't, I'm not so sure that this property is, is developable as developed as it, you know. That was 57 acres that were all pondable. And those are existing conditions. I'm not an engineer, but I'm not I would, either. <laughs> I venture to say that many sites are probably pond, depending on the soil conditions. I wouldn't want to buy one that's ponded. <laughs> so, and that's where the fill comes in, and oh, to to, to grade the the lots. That is after clearing. Uh, after what now, sir? Clearing. Yes, ma'am. I I would assume uh, partially at least. Okay. I'm gonna let me, let me just uh, pass down uh, this was uh, the information I received from the county as far as the status of uh, JJ Road which JJ Road is functionally classified as a local road and it's not on TPO's list of roadway eligible for federal aid Apparently, uh, according to the information that the planning department gave with the county, is that they don't make the determination. It's the uh, transportation uh, planning organization that makes those decisions as far as designations as such. So that's the information I receive uh, from uh, the county. Do we have a, a motion on this item? Do we have a motion on this item? <laughs> uh, you can make a recommendation, uh, denial, or approval, or uh, approval with conditions. Uh, if you make a motion for denial, since this is a quasi-judicial item, you will need to specify some of your reasons or grounds in the record for denial. Is that correct, Attorney? Okay. I believe my light is on. So I'm going to make a motion that we approve. Brooke, what's the name? Brooks Brooke, Landing. <laughs> Brooks Landings um, sketch plat to the city council. Okay. Is that your motion? Yep. Okay, do we have a second to the motion? Do we have a second to the motion? Not hearing any, do we have another motion? I may move that we approve the Brooks Landing sketch plat with two conditions. One clarified engineering drawing of drainage into the Indian River Lagoon, and second clarification of open, um, what's the term? Open land or park open and space. Space. a park and open space with a more specific criteria. Do you wish to suggest any criteria or elements? Not two benches beside a concrete retention pond. I, I'm not an engineer, but I. This is what this looks like, and I'm not happy. Miss Waddell, would you, to be willing to suggest maybe some items or amenities you, that you would like to see in a park setting? 
such as more land pond. surrounding the wetland retention ponds for possible recreation more than just a bench some native vegetation planting of suitable size and suitable is a vague term some serious space around those retention ponds for open areas and any specific elements such as a playground or anything oh uh, god no i don't trail. want walking trails would be not, would be lovely but just sitting under a nice sized tree i need staff to come up with that please because I, do you suggest trees or shrubbery along those or walking both. trails Sorry. or both yes yeah. avoid the elimination of they've and the environmental is, study is very, very, it is extremely good and specific in all the vegetation, and that's a lot of trash vegetation in that environmental study. So just to clarify, additional land behind... Surrounding. Or surrounding the... Each. Each pond. Correct. So I just want to make sure that... I'm just going to go to back to each pond here. And I don't... Is there a criteria for sufficient land? I mean, there needs to be some feet or something. Can't be, it needs to be more than 10. There, there is more than 10 now. Wow. Um, it needs to be doubled that size. So 20 feet of clear, of a clear pathway. Yes. Around each pond. Correct. Um, do you wish to include the northeastern pond, which is um, currently bordered by a jogging trail and wetlands? Yes. Okay. And for clarification on the first condition, an engineer draw a, cl a clarified engineer drawing. Determining how much drainage goes into the Indian River Lagoon? I don't know whether that's measurable or not. I don't think that's a measurable criteria. Uh, but Is the intent to prevent drainage into correct. the Indian River Lagoon? Or to lessen some okay. kind of a some kind of measurement so that we can make a decision that you that a hundred and forty three houses on these little lots are not polluting the Indian River Lagoon with their fertilizer from the, not the behaved grass. Just as a clarification on these ponds, part of the intention of the ponds is to treat stormwater. So um, I'm not sure how much That's it treats good. it. So. That, we're, we're good on that. Okay. Say again, sir? That's okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I would second the motion as long as one additional item as applies, and that is concerning the engineering study, that he be required to meet that engineering study, particularly in the form of wildlife and gopher tortoises, because they're an endangered species. Correct. That the consultant said they're known to live on that site. Mm -hmm. He will have to conduct a separate study so as long as you accept that amendment, I would second the motion. And as a further clarification, that is currently required by our Environmental Protection Tech Manual. He will have to provide a, a, um, an environmental study. And it, in fact, the tech manual specifically um, talks about the impacts to go for tortoise. I want to make sure. OK. okay. Any other? Uh, as I see it, we have a motion with conditions, and we have a, a second. With an additional condition. With a, the additional condition. To ensure the protection of uh, protected species. Of any endangered. OK. I mean, again, I, I don't mean to be repetitious, but this is the only time we see this 
we don't have the uh, environmental studies. We don't have all these studies to make sure that there is compliance. We can't properly perform our function. And uh, I, I know staff has said, well, that'll be done later at site plan. And we never see it again. No. We don't see the preliminary plat approval or the final plat. You see neither one. The, the, Great. Well, let me just add about the condition about gopher tortoises, for example. That's already regulated by the Department of Environmental Protection. So they have to get a permit. I'm not convinced that that's done. So, okay, so your, is your condition to add an additional process? No. Okay. It's to make sure the applicant abides by that. Okay. Okay, is there any further discussion on the motion? Yes, yes. sir. Yes. Um, two points of clarification, because again, I just keep in mind the questions I asked earlier of legal. Um, let me understand the St. John's Water Management has determined that this meets appropriately the water going into the lagoons. Yes, no? Um, the applicant should can, can probably answer that. Right. I'm sorry, you met you... all the requirements of St. John Water Management and discharge into the lagoon and all of that. We will, yes. You will. Yes. And that's required by code? Yes, ma'am, at the pl preliminary plat stage, Got which it. is reviewed by the engineer. And then if I understand this correctly, uh, secondary to that, um, there is, because again, having read the environmental documents today and being concerned about the tortoises also. It's my understanding that, again, that is a process that's existing today, that they are going to have to take another step. I think one of the challenges we have here is, is that we have something that's broken, that needs to have ordinances fixed, so that we are involved in that next step. Um, because it sounds like the community is surrounding us, and every time I've been involved in something like this elsewhere in the country, the commission would have been involved. I just, I'm concerned about asking for an additional engineering study if that's already required or has been done. So that's, that's my only concern. Because as a layperson, when it comes to water, I can't judge necessarily anything except for the findings that are brought to me and the findings that I've seen so far as they've met the requirements am I sad about that absolutely do we need work to do absolutely I'm just concerned that we add a bunch of conditions that actually will just not happen um, so I love the fact that we add conditions saying this open space we would like to see it utilized better I love conditions associated with saying we want to see native vegetation. Um, but when it comes to engineering studies or permitting processes, that's where I get a little concerned. We didn't ask for an, an additional engineering study. Did you? Not, we didn't ask for an additional one. Did you not ask for? What was your original request on verification? You want to repeat it, please? Sure. Um, and, and I'm sorry because I, I, that's what I've understood as well, mm -hmm. that the, end, the existing stormwater study be updated yep. to... Well, clarified. I think what? I'm asking for clarification. I don't know that this is not an excessive runoff. So clarification on whether it, it goes... How it, meets, how it meets the standard, because I'm... I can't judge that. Well, okay. I, as I understood her main, so the impact on the Indian River. Right. Yeah. So that's what I understood. Yes. Yeah, so that what I have here is that we, that he would be required to submit a another engineered drawing, showing less or preventing all drainage into the Indian River Lagoon. Or clarification. Okay. Um, the the problem with that is that. If you add or clarification, it, there's no teeth to that condition. I can so, see that, yes. I think she's wanting, again, or clarification that there is oh, a, oh, no okay. impact to the, on the Indian River Lagoon. I see. Okay, I see. That's, I'm yes. sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this is basically just a condition asking for no impact as far as stormwater 
runoff into the Indivisible Lake. No or less, right? right? Or what impact? What's clarification on the impact? Well, it could be no impact or no runoff, rather, or He's closer. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> less, less than what our code may allow. Say it again. Could be none whatsoever. Correct. Or less than what our code currently al would allow. Correct. Is that a true statement? Correct. Statement? Okay. I'm not assured that there's not going to be with this much. Can, can I just say something? Like St. John's is heavily involved in this. I mean, they're not going to allow anything that's. I just want that in there. Well, yeah, I mean, that it uh, approved by St. John's, is that satisfactory? Um, Meets no, the criteria no, no, of St. John's? No, no. I mean, they are, <laughs> you know, very strict on their requirements. Uh, uh, yeah, no, the no, no, no. Let, let's just clarify as far as the status of your St. John's permit, because I was given information yeah. by the city as to, uh, to check the status and the, and the permit number, and the status is status closed administratively denied and that was on your construction on 71.70 acres 111 unit yes. residential as such i didn't see any pending application on 143 units correct so correct? yeah we're, we're in that process correct we don't that was an old no, permit I, I just want to make sure commissioner murray ask you a very clear question and uh I want to make sure we have accurate information as far as the status. There is no well, approved St. John's permit for this project. Correct? Yeah, correct. At this point, there's no approved, but it's in the process, and they are going to review it in tremendous detail. Correct. Okay. I think the attorney had a question. I wanted to clarify one of the points of Member Spidell's motion. The condition number one she described and number two, two conditions on the development that weren't presented with the application. And as I discussed in my workshop presentation in the beginning of the meeting, a governmental exaction would occur if there's a condition opposed that lacks an essential nexus. So I would just like you to repeat that the legitimate public purpose is roughly proportionate to this project as far as the intent is to protect the, safety, the health of the Indian River Lagoon. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion on the uh, the motion? Just to clarify the second condition, sorry. Um, additional space around the retention ponds. We heard the word 20 feet clear. And does that also include uh, preserving or planting vegetation? Yes. Sir. Is that correct? That's what I heard. So Native within the 20 feet, correct, and you could have the uh, jogging trail in that 20 feet. Right? Yes. Okay. I Thank have you. to. I have to also ask, where did you come up with the 20 foot amount for the to ter, to determine whether there is an essential nexus, nexus with this condition? It just seemed logical. I, it seems to me it probably can partly be founded in the 10 percent uh, yeah. native vegetation requirement of the code and uh, if there is no native vegetation there uh, they're required to establish it so that could be the rational nexus between the two re requirements so the two the 10 percent preservation area and this new area imposed by condition or suggested could be combined. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion or clarification? Okay. Uh, let's have a roll call. Vice Chairman Richardson. Yes. Se Secretary Spidell. Yes. Member Porter? Yes. Member Murray? No. Member Grant? Yes. Chairman Sievers? No. And for the record, I will furnish to uh, staff my grounds or reasons and if, make sure that they're passed on to 
the council. It is my grounds of reasons for voting no. Uh, why don't we take a uh, short break before we uh, go to the next item?
Chairman, this is the not when the agenda is carried over to the last agenda. Forgot to do that, but I thought it. Okay. No problem. <laughs> we'll call the meeting back to order and um, I defer to staff. Mr. Chairman, we uh, at your last meeting, there we, we had an agenda item on there called um, Public Participation Guide, something the city staff created several years ago to help new commissioners and new members and general public understand what planning is about. Um, we forgot to carry it over to tonight's meeting, but uh, before the next agenda item about the comprehensive plan, I, I thought it'd still be a good idea to have a short presentation about that guide that we created to kind of give uh, especially the new members a context of where the comprehensive plan is in planning and what we do so i've asked our new planner uh, naviel fontes with uh, our, the community development department he's joined us only a couple months ago and i asked if he could give us a, 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 a pre the presentation that we some of you have seen actually and um, the public participation guide i think all of you have received at the last agenda and to you, mr grant um, i sent that to you by email so I'll turn it over to uh, sure. Navio. Thanks, Brad. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Chairman, Commissioners, members. Uh, once again, my name is Navio Alfonsis. I'm a planner with the uh, planning department, and I'll be giving you guys a brief uh, presentation on our uh, comprehensive plan as well as our development process. So let's jump right into it. Um, so why do we have a comprehensive plan? Um, essentially, we have a comprehensive plan to identify and meet the needs of the community. Uh, this is done so through forecasting the challenges of growth and change by clearly stating a vision for the future. Um, essentially, the comprehensive plan serves as a blueprint for a when, where, and how of development. And it's also a state requirement in Chapter 163 of the Florida Statutes. So, uh, beginning with the origins of planning, in 1926, uh, the landmark case, Euclid versus Ambler, uh, upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, set the constitutionality of zoning ordinances. Um, in response to rapid growth throughout the state of Florida, we had the Comprehensive Planning Act in 1975, uh, the Comprehensive Planning and Land Development Regulation Act in 1985, and most recently, the Community Planning Act in 2011. So the Comprehensive Plan, it's a visionary document that serves as a roadmap for the city's future by providing a framework for development community building. Um, here in the city of Titusville, the Comprehensive Plan is divided into 10 elements. Those include future land use, transportation, capital improvements, um, public school facilities, housing, infrastructure, conservation element, just to, uh, just to name a few. So for the layout of the comprehensive plan, um, city council first adopts the plan and the goals, objectives, and policies kind of serve as a uh, structuring or formatting um, for, for the plan. Uh, so for the goals, we have broad visionary statements that establish a long-term target for the future. Uh, the objectives are specific performance measures that achieve a more general goal and the policies uh, are specific actions that achieve the objectives and ultimately the broader goal. So here we have a visual depiction of the comprehensive plan. And one of the tools that we use to implement uh, the plan um, is the land development regulations. And within that, we have several elements, including the zoning and development standards, which include um, our subdivision review, our site, our site plan reviews, and our concurrency standards. From there, we have our technical manual and our building codes. And those are kind of the more um, scenario, scenario by scenario, um, case by case, uh, development standards for a specific project. So some factors that drive the plan, we have community values, transportation needs, future land use, environmental concerns, um, community buy-in, community um, input, um, and cultural and social influences. 
So um, just to quick note, we do have a GIS staff, geographic information system. So if any of you guys ever need um, a map as far as, you know, needing specific information about a property or anything like that, feel free to reach out to us and we will, uh, we can provide that for you. Uh, so the GIS allows uh, multiple layers of information to be displayed on a map. Um, through GIS, we're able to analyze and um, understand, understand spatial relationships and patterns. And data included in GIS includes um, demographics, environmental, uh, utility information, and property information as well. So um, within our comprehensive plan, we have comprehensive plan amendments. Um, these are leg legislative actions, and there are two types of amendments. The first one is the text amendments, uh, which are modifications to uh, they're in policies and appeals to all and applies. I'm sorry to all properties within the city's jur jurisdiction. Uh, the second one is the future land use amendments, and those are uh, changes to the land development designations of a property, and they usually require rezoning. So next up, we have our zoning. Uh, regulations and those regulations uh, are established for separate separation of uses residential densities intensities and other development standards and uh, now we're going to talk about our development processes so our first process is the rezoning and uh, obviously the rezoning is a change of a zoning de designation on a property um, so if a property owner wants to change the use on a property, the rezoning would be the uh, procedure that he must abide by to get that uh, rezoning permitted. Uh, a rezoning must be consistent with a comprehensive plan, and it, and it is a quasi-judicial action. Our next development process is a conditional use permit. So a conditional use permit is a special use permitted through a additional review by a public hearing. Um, so um, if that conditional use has some potential for offsite impacts, city council can imp impose some additional conditions so that um, the public health, safety, and welf welfare of the surrounding properties can be uh, protected. Our next development process is a variance, and that is, that's an approved relief on land wherever there is a hardship. So the variances are heard by the Board of Adjustments and Appeals, and if it is, um, if, you know, an applicant wishes to appeal that variance, they must uh, go to circuit court and not the city council. Our next development process is an annexation, and that's a process of in incorporating county land into the city. So uh, properties that are annexed into the city are eligible, eligible to receive city ser services such as potable water, um, waste collection, and that of the such. Next up, we have a plat. Um, a plat is the creation of new lots through the subdivision of land. Obviously, we just had you know, discussion about that. Um, so an example of a plat would be the single family subdivision. And uh, the plats must be approved by city council, of course. Our last development process is master plans and devel development agreements. Uh, the master plan is a negotiated plan approved uh, by city council action. Uh, a development agreement is a contract between the local gov government and the property owner that uh, entails the, the standards and conditions that are applied to, apply to the property. Sorry. Uh, our next process is an administrative process. So we have our site plans, which are engineered site layout that'll, that'll allow the proposed use of the property. Uh, site plans include the building configurations, parking, landscaping, and stormwater. And our last administrative uh, process, I'm sorry, last administrative process are building permits. Um, those are, building permits are required for new construction, um, additional uh, additions to existing structures and major renovations as well as signage and uh, business tax receipts should someone you know want to operate a business within the city of Tallahassee they must uh, operate uh, through a bit first by uh, having a business tax tax receipt um, if you need any more information or want to look over Anything that we just went over, you are more than welcome to with the Land Development Code website as well as the uh, comprehensive plan, of course. Any questions? Any questions? Good presentation, sir.
Thank, Thank you. you. Moving on to uh, the draft 2040 comprehensive plan. Well, thank you, Neville, for giving that presentation. And I will ask for that because it would help some of the members understand the context of where the comprehensive plan is in relation to everything else you're going to be addressing at your meetings. Um, but tonight, uh, what I'm giving you tonight is a, uh, a draft comprehensive plan with the intention of replacing our current one. Um, and I have not given to some of the new members uh, an explanation of what our current comprehensive plan looks like. So uh, I would certainly be available to answer any questions you may have about our current comprehensive plan, send you a link to it so you can see it. I think a few of I have uh, sent that to. Um, it basically is just, as Naviel described, a set of chapters or elements, if you will, with a variety of a listing of goals, objectives, and policies. And that's basically how it's straight uh, um, written out right now. The draft I'm going to present to you tonight is a little different. It's um, kind of revisiting what a comprehensive plan is for and creating it specifically for Titusville. We looked at a variety of different uh, comprehensive plans around the country, including the state of Florida. And we tried to look for those that provided, that were, um, provided the best narrative for the public and also were structured in a way that would be useful and help describe what's going on in that city and the vision of, the people, of, of that particular city. And then um, also those that were received awards by the American Planning Association and other organizations. Um, we decided on a, on a format that we saw over in Temple Terrace in Tampa, and that's why we structured it the way we did. The first half of it is all about places and land use. We're tying them together. Not two, they're not individual exclusive items anymore or elements. They're really tied together. So what happens on your roads and your transportation network impacts the adjacent land uses and vice versa. So they're really interrelated. So that's the first half of that plan, and I'll focus on that a lot through my, my presentation. The second half is everything else that the state requires, and I'll just highlight those. I did give you um, Lay on Your Dice, a brochure, that kind that we did a couple years ago. That we, we distributed when we had our public meetings about this comprehensive plan. It gives you some highlights about the plan and what the changes are. Um, and you open it up, you'll see the schedule. We initially started back in 2017 with this plan. Uh, in 2018, we went forward with uh, drafting it, and we were hoping to maybe have it a draft that could be adopted in some version in 2019. But we ended up, because of COVID and because of additional questions we have about this plan, we had several workshops, especially with the Planning and Zoning Commission back in 2019. And so what you're going to see tonight is and what I've given you is the final version that we've created based on all the input we received from the Planning and Zoning Commission and from other members of the public in primarily in 2019. Um, so with that, I'll go through the presentation real quick. Um, the only person I did not go through this presentation with is Ms. Commissioner Murray. Um, so I will highlight what I believe is important that I'd like you to know. Um, but I won't touch on everything because most of the other members have seen it. And I think you, you said you've looked through the plan already. Yes. Okay. Okay, so the first part really, again, back in 2017, we did visioning workshops. We had a consultant help us out. We held those workshops here with the public, and there were three major key components of that that came resulted from that workshop, those workshops. And that was a vision document that we eventually brought to City Council, and they adopted and approved in 20, January, February of 2018. And then we took that, and all the recommendations from the consultant, Canaan Associates out of Orlando, in addition to another consultant that we worked with on historic preservation, which, um, really helped us out with housing policies. Um, we rolled those two, the work of those two consultants together, plus another consultant we were working with on sea level rise and peril of flood regulations. And so coastal management policies. So there we had several projects going on at one time, including our regular update, seven year update we have to do to update our comprehensive plan that's required by state statute. That's the year evaluation and appraisal report. So we rolled all this together and decided 
we checked the box for whatever the city, what the state required us, but now let's go forward and see if we can rewrite what we have. And that's what we tried to pre present to the, the public through the workshops and to the commission and city council. Um, so the first thing, we took this vision document. The three main key areas that the consultant was really asking us to focus on was the downtown, making it and include policies that are about place making, making it a destination place and making it a place that's walkable and memorable. Another one is the waterfront. The waterfront is not utilized or it's underutilized. And that was a big thing that the consultant was, recommend, was suggesting to us. And the third thing is about our commercial quarters. And from several members of the commission for the past several years and from the public, we have heard a lot of criticism about how our commercial quarters look and operate. And there are a variety of reasons for that. And so the comprehensive plan that we drafted hopefully focuses on the, that area as well. There are many other aspects as well that this comp plan addresses. I'll go through some of the slides, but then I'll go into the major changes that I'm recommending. Oops, hitting the wrong key here. So we took the recommendations from the public. We tried to incorporate that into this comprehensive plan. Um, we also looked at our population estimate and our, our historic growth rate has been 1%. We estimated based on the University of Florida's Business Bureau of Economic and uh, Business Research, I believe it's, it's uh, what the acronym stands for. They do population estimates for all counties and cities in the state of Florida. And we're required by law to utilize that for our comprehensive planning scenarios. So we think we're probably in the medium range and the 1% range. So we're probably in between there, maybe one and a half, maybe 1.25% growth rate is what we're rec suggesting it would be for the next 20 years. That's the, and that's the planning horizon we're looking at. We looked at a lot of, we see a lot of pressure on our marginal lands, wetlands, environmental constrained lands, a lot of subdivisions. You just saw one this evening. Um, and so we're trying to find, we need to find a way to, to either reduce or alleviate the pressure on those lands and allow for redevelopment of our uh, already developed areas, especially our commercial quarters. Those areas are ripe for redevelopment and for new residential development. And an example may be the uh, Kmart building. I throw that out a lot because that was shown by the consultant. The old Kmart building on Cheney Highway it was a derelict building, sat vacant for a long time. Someone's come in, decided to turn it into an indoor storage unit building. And now they want to sell the parking lot in front of it. Well, that was an opportunity to come up with some design standards to say, well, here's how we want that to look, have a shared driveway, access management, all that tied in together. We don't have those standards in place yet, but we tried to work with the applicant on that. Hopefully, with, if we have a new coverage plan or whatever tool that the commission recommends the city council adopt, we can address those kinds of issues. Because there, we have a lot of properties, especially on Cheney Highway and some of our commercial quarters, that are definitely ripe for redevelopment. Key issues with our current comprehensive plan, population growth, we have mar marginal lands, we have a lot of exclusionary zoning. So we have a lot of scenarios in the past couple of decades where we flip plot land use and zoning. We have a binary choice right now in a lot of our commercial quarters. It's either commercial or it's residential. And so applicants come to us and say, I want to change this. The market's telling us that I can put a multifamily development here. Well, it says commercial on there. You're not allowed to do it. So now they come to you to ask you, is that okay? Ten years, so they go ahead and get it approved. Ten years later, someone else says, hey, wait a minute. That property's marketed for something commercial. I'm sorry, you're not allowed to do that. You've got to come back to you again. So we see that a lot. And we just wonder if that's even useful as far as a comprehensive planning policy. If it's, you saw it already and approved several times that it's good for residential or commercial, why not make it a mixed use land use? Um, another issue is we have a high retail vacancy rate, which obviously because of the COVID issue, which is probably gonna increase. Um, and we also have high parking and setback standards more so than I believe in other communities. In fact, we had one developer come to us and show us a study of comparison of parking standards compared to other cities in, in the county, and we were probably the highest. Um, uh, every few years, there's an organization called uh, Smart Growth. Yes, ma'am. The parking that we have a higher parking ratio requirements than most other communities, especially in, in Brevard County. So, for example, we had an, uh, a developer come to us and say they wanted to put in a, a multifamily development, and the code required 
two, two uh, parking spaces per unit plus another half for guest parking. So that's two and a half spaces per unit, and that's a lot higher than most other communities. And in Brevard County, I think that was the highest. I think the parking requirements could be based on where the development is going to be located. So if it's located to other adjacent mixed-use developments, it probably could end up having a lower ratio of parking because of the adjacent parking that's already there. But if it's going to be farther out the field in a suburban area that's kind of by itself, it probably does need that two spaces per unit. It's Every scenario is a little different, but all that needs to be looked at. Um, Dangerous by Design is a, or, uh, a report that was published by Smart Growth America, and the latest report identified seven of the top ten most dangerous metropolitan statistical areas in the, in the country in the state of Florida. And Titusville is rolled into the Palm Bay Melbourne MSA, and so we're the third most dangerous by design. Now, I've heard from some council member, it was a council member when we brought this to the, their attention, was that well, Titusville is far away from the other, the larger metropolitan area of Brevard County. And that may be true, but we're designed the same way. So I did point out to a few members about how we do access management. So you have a, a major commercial corridor, and every development has to have its own driveway. That can be fairly dangerous for a pedestrian to navigate. And that's one aspect of what they mean by dangerous by design. Um, uh, how wide is wide enough? So we can continue to dump you know, a lot of development onto our arterials or our collector roads, but at some point we're going to meet a, exceed our level of service standard and have to widen them. I worked for a community once where we actually had to stop development because we were exceeding FDOT's level of service standard on a major roadway. Some communities are, are in that scenario, and Titusville is definitely not. Um, yeah, I'm going to show you some examples of what this illustrates, uh, you can see on the south, the lower portion of this illustration here is a more suburban style type development with a uh, you know, cul-de-sac subdivision and maybe some small lot you know, retail developments on, on the major road there, um, all dumping out with a few roads to that major road. Or the traditional type neighborhood development you see on the north side there. So we do have that here in Titusville. It has been neglected or avoided. A lot of communities are starting to look back at this new traditional type development. Some of the commissioners who are here now um, probably remember the presentation I gave you about uh, that was presented to us by, um, well, presented at another conference, but I presented to you his presentation about how block standards, short block standards can distribute traffic as opposed to dumping it onto a major roadway. And that's what this image pretty much illustrates here. That on the north image there, the, the image that, or the development pattern on the north side of that collector road can handle a significant amount of density, even though they're all local roads. You see this on the left side of this image here, uh, typical suburban style sprawl type development with, you know, parking lots in front, strip center development. And then you have a more compact, complete type community on the right side here with buildings closer to the street and relocating that parking or even allowing for shared parking. We have that kind of development pattern already in our downtown. This image here are images com that come from the draft comprehensive plan. This image on the right is our downtown. So we have a core block pat development pattern here already. And there's a lot of vacant property in this area. And it's available and ripe for development and infill development. <laughs> then on the left side here, that image is an area on the north, uh, uh, the north segment of US-1 from the downtown going up to Parish Road. Uh, road. And so you can see a more suburban style type, sprawl type development there. So the majority of the city is like that. Um, this is a context classification categories that the Florida Department of Transportation has developed and are utilizing to identify each segment of the roads that they maintain. And this is really important because they will classify roadway segments eventually based on what local community regulations or plans, what local communities have adopted. So if they have long-term plans or short-term plans that ask for certain types of development patterns along roadways that they maintain, they will consider a particular classification for that roadway. And that could be really important because that will help inform what kind of infrastructure and 
uh, multimodal transportation facilities they will put on those roadway segments, such as wider sidewalks, such as landscaping, such as uh, access management, shorter driveways, um, bike lanes, things, maybe even road diets. I mean, BevDOT has considered those before. Um, we believe this comprehensive plan is consistent with a lot of the other plans in the community, such as the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization's Long Range Vision document, the city's uh, Economic Development Strategic Plan, and the CRA's or the Downtown Master Plan Vision document for the community redevelopment area of our downtown, and many other plans that we currently have as well. Um, these are just some example images of the consultant suggested that kind of illustrate. Here's what you could do in your downtown. Um, Placemaking is a major component now of this new comprehensive plan. So it's a new term that's being used in a lot of communities now. Um, focus on our downtown. Focus on the area of our downtown to support the downtown, that's sort of the surrounding area, rather. Um, and take advantage of that traditional street grid that we have right now. It can in, uh, accommodate a variety of different multimodal transportation facilities, such as sidewalks and bike lanes. They did workshops and identified, I believe, something that's kind of missing in our downtown, is that is a park space, a centralized park space in our downtown. Um, that was came out, that was one of the results that came out of the workshops we had with the, with the uh, consultant when they consulted the, pub, the uh, workshops in 2017. Um, Identify areas where you could put parks or, or seating areas or, or place, you know, identify places to create placemaking opportunities in the city, especially in our downtown. Have uh, specific urban style design standards for the downtown. Now, this is different for our commercial corridors. Uh, I'll show you some illustrations of what they recommended, our consultant recommended as far as uh, what we could do along our commercial corridors. And those would be a little bit different type of development standards. Identify where the building should be. Identify where your parking should be. Um, identify how that frontage of that building should look, how far away it should be from that street, from that sidewalk. Um, identify areas where you can put enhanced landscaping. Currently, our code requires an uh, off, off the back 20 foot landscape buffer on every public right of way. But that doesn't, and it just identifies how much vegetation you put in there. But as they get into details of what it all should look like or how it all should be tied in, the road, street, sidewalk network to the uses that are going on in the street, on the proper property. And you can make activity centers or activity placemaking opportunities between those buildings and the streets and the sidewalk. You could allow some parking between that building and the street, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a large parking lot. It could be half bay parking or parallel parking. In the new plan, we uh, consolidated several residential land use categories into one super neighborhood residential land use category. And then we froze the density, basically, using a maximum allowable density map. And I've introduced that new based on the comments I received from the commission at the, back in 2019. So I'll show that real quick what that is. But that freezes the density. And that's always been the biggest concern of the commission and the public. Is this new plan going to increase density all over the city? And I don't think it will. It does increase it to somewhat on the commercial corridors because that creates mixed use land use categories. So remember, on the commercial corridors, you have that binary choice, commercial or residential. We're now combining them together and calling them all a mixed use land use category. Gateway corridor is what we called it. And we put in a, a, land, a maximum density of 15 units per acre. So that's really where the, mac, the increase in density is happening. Everywhere else, we are trying to freeze it where it is now. So if the property has a five units per acre maximum density, we're not increasing it in that super neighborhood land use classification that I just mentioned. Housing, the historic preservation off, uh, consultant uh, asked us about uh, um, offering or trying to encourage opportunities for alternative types of housing. Right now, we get two types of housing requests, detached single family subdivisions or garden style apartments. So what about other types of housing that we've forgotten about? Duplexes, triplexes, courtyard apartments, bungalow courts, courtyards, uh, townhouses, live work situations. 
we have a current tool in our, comp in, our, in our code right now that allows you to create a subdivision and there is an incentive right now to make allow for uh, very small lots at the same density and thereby preserving a lot of open space possibly. I think you saw an illustration of what uh, we have right now. Currently that, that particular uh, Brooks Landing uh, development was approved under our current plan development process and that required a, off the back a 35% open space requirement. In that scenario, that re required or allowed them to use their stormwater air retention areas as part of that open space requirement. So all of that could be looked at again, I think, with this comprehensive plan or whatever parts that you want to take out of it to use as new tools. The plan development process can allow right now those kind of subdivisions uh, or mixed use development. And so I mentioned at the beginning of the five o'clock meeting about that potential opportunity of creating minimum standards for mixed use development going through a rezoning process with minimum standards. Currently, we don't have those standards, but we'll have to create those. We have examples in our city right now. This is in Lacita. We have on this same street a planned unit development that has single family homes, six unit condos, six town home buildings, and patio homes, which are really small lot single family homes, all on the same street, part of and approved as part of a planned unit development rezoning back in the 80s. So it's not something we don't have. Um, one thing that our council, I believe, is very supportive of is the consolidation of several of our industrial and some high intense commercial land uses into this super research and manufacturing land use. And I just think of the big Space Coast Airport, south part of the city, and everything around it that's industrial under one big land use. And we think that would be a huge advantage of selling point to say this is our research and manufacturing area. Mobility, our transportation element was, we blew it out completely and now we cover not just roadway capacity, but sidewalks, bike lanes, transit, even golf carts. So we tried to make a lot of changes into that transportation element of our current comp plan and now it's called the mobility element. So it touches on all kinds of different transportation modes. Access management is gonna be a big thing that we're gonna to have to address later on to help implement these policies if they're adopted. Uh, we combined our open space and environmental policies into one. I'm gonna, when I get to the comprehensive plan, I'm really just gonna go straight to the environmental section because that was the area that was the most uh, of concern of the Planning and Zoning Commission. But I can certainly go into answer any other parts of the comprehensive plan when I get to it, if you like. But I wasn't going to go through page by page. Um, so this is the second half of the comprehensive plan, the draft. So we threw in all the other state statutory required stuff. Uh, there are concurrency related facilities, transportation, water and sewer, stormwater, solid waste, schools. These are things we have to think about as we grow and we have to plan for as new development occurs. Uh, there's a map in the comprehensive plan of the boundaries of our area of critical concern. This is where we draw our water. Um, and also our reclaimed water uh, facilities. We also have, we carry over the, comp the capital improvements element of our current comprehensive plan into this new one and also our intergovernmental coordination element into this new plan with some tweaks. I believe our schedule for our capital improvements could be more detailed but we don't have that direction so right now it's basically what we have adopted last time back in 2019 we carried over into this new draft and we're supposed to update that and bring that to you every year that schedule. And what it is is a five-year schedule of capital improvements of roads, water lines, where we're going to put our sewer, and so on throughout the city. And we have to plan for that and bring that to you for approval. Um, we did introduce a parks level of service standard to replace our current one. And so what we're envisioning here is that you have a new subdivision come in, for example, a new re residential development. And if it's not located within a quarter mile walking distance of an existing park, then they wouldn't have to put in a new park as part of development. If, I'm sorry, if they are not located within a quarter mile walking distance of one that's existing, then they would need to incorporate a new park facility as part of their development. Um, and so that's what we're envisioning. And that would be something we'd have to put into our, our code, rather. Um, 
So again, the new parks level service standard is what I just mentioned. Um, there were a lot of questions I received from the commission last year about greenhouse, you know, green policies, low impact development policies. That's what LID means there. Um, and so I tried to address or highlight throughout the comprehensive plan what I thought were policies, goals, objectives, policies that address anything that's green related, sustainability, and low impact development. And that includes our mobility policies as well and our mixed use land use categories because that talks about compact development, um, having a smaller footprint. That's definitely a green policy. Um, and our mobility strategies, where or policies rather, where it talks about a focus now on, on working on a trail network, a pedestrian network, a bicycle network, uh, transit, and looking at highway expansion or roadway expansion or widening as a last resort. So to, again, I think that's consistent with sustainability policies and green um, uh, focus on green issues as well, environmental issues. Um, lastly, and you do not have this in your draft, is we have a working draft of the implementation matrix. And that mean, that would just be a, an outline of which agencies would be responsible for implementing which portions of the comprehensive plan. So if this goes forward, we'll come back to you with that in particular. Um, so key strategies of this comprehensive plan include, we would recommend to help implement them, new urban, style, urban development style de design standards of, that address building orientation, front engine access management. We went ahead and got a multimodal master plan approved. Um, that was just really phase one. There is a phase two that may come later on depending on grant funds that are available. Uh, we could do a recreation and open space master plan for the city. Uh, we did do a resiliency strategic plan that addresses sea level rise, and that needs to, that should be updated every few years. And then we also have a waterfront master plan that should be that was originally approved in 2007 that should be approved. Um, it was is a rec recommended to be approved or looked at again with this comprehensive plan. And we have a strategy in there to look at creating neighborhood plans throughout the city. So that's working with this, with the actual neighborhoods, certain of the city, and coming up with policies or a land use plan or capital improvements plan that is specific to them, to that area. So we received your PNZ's written uh, questions, and we tried providing answers back in June 2019. We held several workshops in 2019. Uh, I took those recommendations. I tried to incorporate. As much as possible, what I thought we could, ex the staff could recommend and support into this draft. So we updated several goals, objectives, policies, and I'm going to show you several slides of the land use map where we made some changes. And then also we included that new maximum density map. So, and then I also highlighted several areas that the commission was concerned about, such as where are policies related to shared parking. Um, ADA standards, uh, green infrastructure, recycling, tiny homes, um, and also the functional value of wetlands and no net loss of wetlands. Um, I do want to touch on a few of these here. The ADA, we, uh, Commissioner Richardson and I did discuss this a little bit, and I think we could probably develop a policy that expands on it a little bit more um, to kind of highlight that as an important component of how we develop in the city of Titusville. We currently do have to follow the federal guidelines for ADA, and that's the American with Disabilities Act, as far as how we uh, develop and provide access for those who are um, disabled to buildings and sites around the city. Brad, can I just add a comment to that? Yes, sir. Um, Titusville has a higher than average number of disabled people. Um, if you just go to the... Uh, tax collector's office and see my, how many uh, handicapped parking placards are used in just Titusville. It's amazing. And we went to a planning conference uh, last, uh, when was that? The one that we went to Holiday Inn. That was back in October, yeah. Yeah, and the number the average number of older people in Titusville is extremely high. Now, I don't know if that changes with this 
new uh, space effort with SpaceX and Blue Origin and all that. But uh, we, we already had a high number of disabled and older people. So Mr. Richardson is referring to that workshop we had last. There was a workshop we offered and invited everybody to to attend where we had someone from AARP come and talk about uh, planning and and uh, an older generation in your communities and how do you plan for that. Um, so again, we, we can revisit and come up with a policy that kind of highlights that more so than what we have than just a simple reference in our comp comprehensive plan right now. Um, functional value of wetlands and known net loss of wetlands. Commissioner Severs has brought that up and, and sent us several questions about that. I try to highlight where those are all located and reference inside the comprehensive plan. Uh, known net loss of wetlands was, he and I did discuss the question about whether right now we rely on the St. John's Water Management District when it comes to someone or a developer coming in to want to mitigate wetlands inside the city of Titusville. So they could mitigate through the St. John's Water Management District and basically buy credits for somewhere else inside the, the basin that might include areas outside, would definitely include areas outside of Titusville. So Titusville is just part of a larger basin of North Brevard and Volusia County. So the question is, this, should that be defined as only known that loss of wetlands within city boundaries? And that's very difficult to answer. So I don't know if Mr. Stevers wants to address that or but that's something that will be very difficult to address later on. But right now, I just wanted to highlight where those are in the comp plan. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I strongly feel as though that the city should have a no net loss within the city of Titusville. Um, my experience over the years with the St. John's Water Management District and their interest in uh, selling um, uh, credits in Volusia County uh, that's where the money goes and that's where the uh, land is saved. Uh, and um, for example, on, on uh, Brookshire Development, on uh, Garden Street, on Brooks Landing, um, we have so many wetlands that are one, two, three, four, not five acres and they may be located in a series. And in my mind, most of the time, if you just, for example, looking at Brooks Landing, they could easily, if they want to, because of uh, their layout, want to uh, uh, destroy uh, two acres of wetlands on the northwest corner they could expand the existing wetlands and establish two acres on site. They can easily do that. Uh, on uh, Brookshire de development off of Garden Street, you see a series of small wetlands, all frankly interconnected, but they count them separately and you allow the destruction of the wetlands here to buy some land from Farmington Water Resources in Volusia County, what benefit is that to the citizens of Titusville? Since the mid-1990s, Bavard County uh, has a policy of no net loss, and it has to be done within Bavard County. Uh, whether we can piggyback with Bavard County, that certainly would be far better because I've reviewed numerous permits recently where automatically, for example, the new uh, Cumberland Farms out there, it, it, guess what? <laughs> they paid a significant amount of money to buy wetlands and uh, it, part of the mitigation bank in Volusia County. How does that benefit the citizens of Titusville? It doesn't. And I think it's very important that we have a no net loss wetlands. And I know many groups think so. And I believe most of the time they can be satisfied right on site. If you, if you want to destroy that half acre or acre of wetlands, you can create it over here where you have existing wetlands and expand it. And um, I think that should be the policy of the city and clearly stated. That's, that's my personal view. <laughs> And I think, I mean, 
far as I'm concerned, and, and his boss, <clears throat> Peggy, and I have had disagreements about this because I think under our existing comprehensive plan and land development regulations, we don't just defer to St. John's because we have our own requirements. For example, around wetlands and even on uh, Brooks Landing, uh, you're supposed to have vegetative buffers to protect the functional value of the wetland. They weren't designated on that drawing whatsoever, but it's a part of our requirements. And uh, I've seen many instances where because of lot layouts, uh, St. John's will allow them to uh, destroy that. So, oh, by the way, you have to pay X number of dollars for mitigation. So buy land in Volusia County to mitigate that. What is that doing for the benefit of the citizens of Titusville? I don't, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we've a, lot of <laughs> a lot of workshops on this, a lot of discussions about it. But I think, let me just say, when I conclude, I'm going to ask the commission to either find this plan acceptable, maybe some tweaks, or if it is not acceptable, then we just go back and continue working with our current comprehensive plan. Or the third option <clears throat> I would suggest is that maybe the commission can make motions or recommendations to say, I like this part, let's keep that make it into regulation or incorporate into our current comp plan. So that could be an option. I just recommend, I suggest that at the end of this presentation. If, if you don't mind, let me just say, uh, um, I'm ready to move forward. I would like to see us moving forward. And uh, I spend a lot of time and I have written out all kinds of comments and recommendations. Uh, which certainly can pass on to staff and uh, hopefully they be passed on to council. Uh, I think it's probably unfair, particularly the new, new members, to expect them to say, okay, go forward. And please remember, uh, this is just recommending transmittal to the state. So they review, they come back, and then you have another second bite at it so to speak. Well, we haven't even got to the first advertising. No, sir. This is just information. Yeah, you know, we don't have this in a public hearing setting at all. all right. no. We have at least two public hearings. At least two. Yeah, the way we... Transmittal plus the... Correct. The other one. Correct. I have some comments. Um, there were seven members of court on planning and zoning. Only three of us commit, uh, submitted questions for the staff. That was former Chairman Williams, Dwight Severs, and me. Our uh, questions and the staff's answer to those takes 29 pages. And um, I think most of them have been addressed. I still think there are some that I would not say tweaking, I'd say wrenching. Something need to be wrenched, but I'm for the most part satisfied with it. Um, in addition, since we can't distribute to members of planning and zoning, I received this today from Zach Giffen. I think you all know him, the Tiny Homes Show. He addressed it to editorial board of the New York Times, where there's three cities that have addressed tiny homes, and they call it movable accessory dwelling units. <laughs> and you can move them, and in fact, they're used for infill. And it's a pretty long, it will cover about eight pages. But it's, it's got a lot of new ideas. Not that we should develop these in the tiny homes ordinance that we're thinking about and addressing in the comp plan, but it's got some that we should consider. Um, in addition, the green infrastructure that I've addressed several times 
and I shouldn't say this, but I was lone Republican on the, this commission for years. Um, I, I'm meaning things like charging stations for electric vehicles in parking lots throughout the community. And uh, I think we need to address this green infrastructure, not just a pie in the sky, but deliberately uh, choose items that need to be green. In addition, uh, well, I've talked about ADA. I, I don't think this begins to address the ADA. The shared parking is a, has been a situation that when I was on council and you were city attorney, and when I was previously on this commission, the shared parking is a mess. Take Highway 50, for example. If you go from Wells Fargo Bank to stop by the new storage facility and then go by uh, that auto parts place, you've got to go back on Highway 50 and turn in. Go back on Highway 50 and turn in. There should be shared parking throughout the city of Titusville. They're bad on the opposite side of Highway 50 also. And um, that's one thing that I really think we need to address. Um, but it's about ready, I'd say. Brett, could I find out, putting our newer commissioners on the spot, <laughs> Do you need uh, additional time to review this, to feel comfortable making a recommendation to move forward or move forward with changes or, and Commissioner Murray, I'll start with you. <laughs> um, so I read the last comp plan in detail, I had 101 notes on it, similar to some of the comments you guys made. I read this one in detail, so he mentioned that I didn't come for the presentation, but we did have some discussion, and I talked about all of the concerns I had. Um, in fact, one of the things that I asked for tonight was potentially the opportunity to show you where I came from, because everything you're asking for, I've come from a community that did it. And their comp plan looked a little bit different, um, but it accomplished up, well, except for tiny homes, because tiny homes ended up being on, you had the ability to put it on somebody else's lot, because um, they considered them trailer homes. But um, everything, clear goals in regard to charging stations, green roofs, solar power, uh, fleets that only ran on natural gas or electric, clear on how that happened, um, housing that took infill and figured out how to make that successful, took um, commercial properties and turned them into multi-use, identified 35 neighborhoods in order to make multimodal, and some of these things work. Um, so there were challenges to this. As an example, um, I mentioned this document and the comp plan. If you merge the two, you come closer to what St. Louis Park had because of the economic impact. And it also clarified a few things, such as in this plan right now, um, they're pursuing putting parking lots behind, um, and I don't know the streets well enough, but if I'm behind uh, uh, Play Linda Brewery downtown, that parking lot that exists today is a potential location for a multi-level parking lot. To me, that's contradictory to protecting the waterfront. Why am I putting a multi-story parking lot closer to the water versus east uh, or west of one? So those type things are things that kind of challenged where it was going. My commitment I made to Brad in our discussion was, if you're comfortable with this, I'm absolutely going to support it. I just wanted you to at least have a reference point that you could understand where I come from or even have a reference point to see where it got done. Everything you're asking for, St. Louis Park did. Parks in neighborhoods, all of those things, tree protection plans, they were all in the comp plan. The difference is they said, where were we? And every 
section, where are we now and where are we going with very clear, measurable items. This is where we're going to be by this point in time. And I didn't quite see the measurable component as consistently as I would like to have seen in this um, because that's what really holds you to getting it done. As an example, for a multimodal in um, St. Louis Park, we had to work within the county and then the seven county and then the state because a key element was we are not going to put money into vehicle lanes. We are not going to put four lanes in. We are going to put two brand new lanes in, and we're going to have a bus lane, and we're going to have a biking lane, and we're going to have brand new sidewalks. That was their multimodal component. So any dollars associated with expanding 405 to four lanes, you had to rethink all of that. And so um, I'm excited about where the plan goes. I did find it extremely hard to digest. I don't know if anybody else did, but it's so hard to read. At the end of the day, the plan that I'd like you all to see ended up with a presentation this big that really highlighted so that if somebody said, where are we going? And literally every time you went to a meeting, whether it was bridge club or something else, every school, everybody got it so they knew this is where we're heading. The plan itself. 315 pages. <laughs> you don't have to double it, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of pretty pictures, but a lot of detail behind every single policy. So what is it that's going to get us to that? So we had, I think, a good conversation. And like I said, I'm going to support whatever. <laughs> that's probably going to surprise you that we're going to get a yes out of Mary tonight. But um, Well, uh, that I was really trying to find out, do you need additional time so you could put in writing or however you want to, some additional comments or recommendations to pass on to staff? And then he would have that and then with the ability to move on to city council. So here's my concern. Um, because I look at the plan differently, I'm concerned that I could bog this thing down for a good long time. You don't want to do that. No. <laughs> so that's why I said to Brad, I'm going to support it. It's part of my role to support it. Um, but again, I really would like at some point, because every seven years we have a chance to kind of relook at this, and as we move forward, we can kind of rethink things. I would love for people to at least have a reference that they could go to and say, okay, that's how you communicate it a little better. I joked. I said to my husband, my husband turned to me one night and said, I can't sleep. <laughs> I had my computer up and I said, read this. <laughs> and he was like, oh, OK. <laughs> because it's policy line after policy line after policy line after policy line. And it doesn't tell a story very well. And if you can't tell the story or the history, your history with you know, the St. John Water Management District it's important to understand how that works so that we then can say, okay, this is the history of it. This is where we are. They're giving all of our stuff to Volusia. This is where we want to be. We want all of that to come back to us. Well, let me and ask, it's hard uh, to read it in the policy. Commissioner Porter, I, I know this is a lot to ask of you, sir, but uh, would you... Um, feel like, uh, how, how do you want to proceed? I would proceed with uh, Brad's recommendations. Um, I don't think I've uh, been here long enough to go through the comprehensive plan. I've read it a couple times, and I'm still digesting all of the uh, things that you're recommend <laughs> recommending. I sat with Brad last week. He was gracious enough to uh, go through this presentation with me. Um, I have no uh, reason to go back and hold up the process. Uh, you guys have been working on this since 19, sounds like, and uh, I would uh, agree that I would go along with the recommendations that you guys would make. Can I just make right. one quick comment, quick? Quick. Yeah. Can you just flip it to four, section four of the environment? Um, just again, so that you understand, it's the same thing, only because it's communicated a little bit better.
But when you mentioned charging stations, or in the case of this, we did connect the park. Every sidewalk in the city became ADA compliant. The law only requires when the sidewalk is replaced to be ADA compliant. And we said no. We have an aging population. We have so on and so forth. Every single one. Um, so this was kind of the area that we talked about, and it literally addressed every concern that we've had and how we dealt with it. So um, from wetlands, which we have in Minnesota, to parks, to charging stations, to all of those things. So my only point is, I, at some point, this needs to become more readable so that people can digest it and live by it. So, sorry. Commissioner Grant. Well, I agree with uh, Commissioner Porter here. I've had the pleasure of, uh, well, the opportunity to read the, uh, the draft of the new uh, plan. And personally, I like it. I really do. Um, prior to this, I wasn't aware that Titusville even had a comprehensive plan. I'm sorry? You got to get closer to your mic. Oh, I'm sorry. I get closer to my mic. Like I was saying, prior to this, I wasn't even sure Titusville had a comprehensive plan. But what I see, I like. I like the vision that it, it shows, the, the, the where we want to be in 20, 40 years. I, I like it very much. And with my limited knowledge, I wouldn't change a thing. Okay. Thank you, sir. One comment, can I make? Sure. Um, I think we need to communicate to the staff that a situation like it uh, tonight with Brooks Landing, which does not abide by the present comprehensive plan as far as the streets having only one point of egress and ingress, that if we adopt this, we expect staff to buy by it too, as well as planning and zoning. We don't have any anything to say over which council does, but we're going to stick by this comprehensive plan. And we need assurance of staff they're going to stick by it too. What we've drafted here for you is a work plan, basically, for the city. Um, so even with our current comprehensive plan, there's a lot of policies in there that ask for the city to do things. And some of that has not been done, mainly be probably because some, a lot of it has been done, but a lot of it has not been completed because maybe because of uh, resources or staffing or whatever it might have been, or maybe some change in law, whatever it was. So. This is a vision document with goals and objectives and policies to help us get to where we hope to be. And so it's only as good as the actions of the city and the staff and the people who live here are in wanting to implement it and continue it. So yeah, we, we are under the gun. If this is approved, this is something we, we have a work plan then that I think is more specific and, and outlined for us as far as what to do compared to the current comp plan. And one more question. I agree with Commissioner Murphy that it needs to be simplified. The way it reads now might as well be in Excel. <laughs> Is it supposed to be written in that way? Does the state require it? Have you looked at the current comp plan? Yes, I have. <laughs> so it's a list of goals and objectives and policies. So what we tried to do was not repeat it, but kind of restructure it so that does, we, I mean, the idea of, of going above and beyond like what other communities outside the state of Florida have done, we had to be careful with that because what you put in that comp plan is now under the purview of the state. Mm -hmm. And so anytime you want to make a change to it, even a word, you got to go back and get their approval for it. So what a lot of communities have done is say, well, the policy, goals, objectives, and policies are the ones that are really the ones that the, the parts of the comp plan are the most important in what you implement. So if you change any of those, those go to the state. But everything else is kind of this background material. So we didn't want to go too far beyond what we have, 
but we did want to expand on the policies to kind of flesh out more than what we have right now. It should be readable and understandable okay. by the citizens of Titusville. It sounds like we need a narrative, mm -hmm. a contextual narrative. That's what it sounds like. Okay. It's like starting over, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you don't want to start over. Well, it's not just that. It's the we had the consultant help us out with that structure, that and right now we don't have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> we, and we don't, we don't have the resources to be able to go back and restart, start over, on that structure again. Well, so. let me ask you, uh, I, I'm trying to see where we are and uh, whether we want to proceed. How do you want to proceed? Uh, uh, my plan was to give you uh, my additional comments that I have and uh, give a copy to all the other commissioners as well. And um, I thought perhaps uh, if others have something they want to provide you prior to the next meeting, my objective would be at the next meeting, let's uh, see where we are. And my, my position is let's move forward. <laughs> I agree. The next let's meeting. move forward. Okay. And, and everybody seems to have that consensus. Let's move forward. And uh, we've played with this long enough, Brad. Well, it sounds like to me that the what we've drafted so far is acceptable, but obviously some tweaks need to be made. or. Some wrenching well, to some I, parts. I yeah. have to, um, as you know, from the very beginning, when I first reviewed it in 2018, my two major concerns was protection of the Indian River Lagoon and protections of the city's well field. My first read of the new plan was we, we didn't, we did not make any improvement in that whatsoever, and the Indian River Lagoon. It's been almost a failure. In quoting uh, Mr. Barnes on our uh, well field, uh, we, uh, we have the well fields diminished in size, likely due to groundwater withdrawals and past land development practices. So in my mind, in the interest of the public and the citizens, we need to somehow protect those resources. If that requires additional um, criteria or studies or whatever, we need to do that. Because I don't, and with all due respect to St. John's Water Management District, we've had their ponds and their designs for the last 30 to 40 years. And it all ultimately dumps into the Indian River Lagoon. And look what has happened to the water quality in the Indian River Lagoon. So to I think uh, everybody thought they were the best management practices and held in high esteem, et cetera. But look what has happened to the city of Titusville under its current comprehensive plan and with their regulations. We need to improve upon that at the same time, allowing development and reasonable development and a proper balance between the two. And, and I agree with the, uh, Commissioner Murray, yes, we need development, we need growth, but you've got to have some proper mm -hmm. balance because at the end of the day, what legacy are we leaving our citizens? What legacy are we leaving our children? We have to think about that rather than just, what can I get today? We have to think well beyond that. So um, I have to compliment you. You've taken to heart a lot of the things we've said and inserted a lot of things. And I appreciate that because, because you've obviously uh, realized some of those things are important as well. So uh, I want to move forward. Uh, my plan is just to give you what I have to pass out to others. And in the meantime, if the fellow commissioners would like to provide any kind of input and let's try to vote upon this and moving forward. We'll make myself available again to meet with you individually, okay. ask any questions, uh, and can go over any the, even the land use changes that I suggested that are in the plan as well. So, why don't we have a workshop meeting to discuss this, devoted strictly to the comp plan to pass? Oh, well, it can't be a workshop; it's got to be a special meeting. 
we? At your next meeting, I don't believe you have anything on the agenda. Okay. So if you continue to the next meeting, that's going to be okay. the only topic. Satisfied with that? Would like, someone like to make a motion we continue this to, uh, to, the, to the next meeting? If you'd like to do that, that's, I'll take whatever motion you have. Um, I, I mean, I do have a few more slides, but I th it sounds like everybody's heard enough, have seen enough, and read enough. So it's up to you. We've read it. <laughs> We've read it. <laughs> do, do you want to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we continue the comp plan discussion to the next um, planning and zoning meeting to allow additional input to... Um, be our final draft. Second. In discussion. All those in favor, uh, I don't think we need a roll call vote on that. All those in favor, please say yes. 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 Those opposed, no? Okay. And here's here's a here's my some copies of my stuff. Here's my stuff. Brad keeps making me work too much. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. <laughs> I noticed the next agenda item, 9F, rezoning, uh, that has been withdrawn. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And the next item, 11, semi-annual report. Yes, sir. That, that is within your packets. Um, if you would like to amend that report or add... Anything to it, um, we would entertain those recommendations. Well, I, you have to admit, I'm the culprit. I saw it on the city council agenda, <laughs> and I'd never seen it, and we were making a report to them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my suggestion is this, that uh, is that on this, for example, CUP 7-2019, I would like to see what our recommendation was and what council's action was uh, as a part of the report. Uh, I'd like to see how, whether they're accepting our recommendations or not accepting our recommendation. If we include uh, three conditions and they adopt one, I would like to see that. So, so we can see how uh, they are accepting our recommendations. And uh, that would be my only um, comment or recommendation, sir. Anyone else have any comment or recommendation? I kind of read somewhere that the annual report should also have the status of members. When recent members appointed and people that are not meeting the requirement to attend so many meetings. I don't know that the attendance report necessarily does, but an update on members I do believe would be appropriate. Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying an attendance report, but a status including new members. And it, so you, you would like something added to the semi report submitted to city council that indicates the status of, what status exactly are we looking for reporting to them? New Just, members that we've had since the last report. Okay. Just the names of yeah. people who are appointed since okay. the fact that it maybe half the commission has turned over in six months. Okay. Anyone else have any uh, comments or recommendations? I'm interested in this vacation and on uh, item is it supposed to be va vacation as in to vacate or let's go someplace? <laughs> <laughs> Vacating, <laughs> abandoning. Thank you. Yeah. I just thought I was missing something. <laughs> um, Chairman Sears, I guess yes. my question in regard to that, and again, not having seen an annual report before and having heard some of the discussions recently, at what point do we put forward concerns to the city council in regard to things that are potentially holding us back? The sketch plan tonight, the reference was that we're not included in the next process. You know, I've heard things like that. At any point, do you get to say to the city council? Um, you would be able to express that in your individual reports. Individual reports. Yes, ma'am. 
but this, yes, you could do that, but this is an opportunity for the commission is collectively to add anything they would like the council to read this particular report. While you're also having this discussion, I'd just like you all to acknowledge whether you'd like to see it again before it gets sent to council. It was pulled from the July 14th city council meeting for approval and it is on the 728 agenda. But if you'd like to see it again, then of course we would need to delay city council accepting that report. Yeah, I think we should review it and approve sending it to council. Okay. Should that be in a form of a motion? Yes. Okay, I move that the staff put together our semi-annual report and pass it by member Seavers quietly without the rest of us knowing <laughs> and appear on the next agenda of the meeting on um, the, what, the 28th or whatever that's, no, and that'll be sometime in August. Your that's next meeting's on the 5th of August. The 5th of August. It'd be on the agenda for August the 5th. Do we have a second for the motion? Second. second. We've got two seconds. <laughs> All those in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, yes. no. Okay, passes. <laughs> Next item is uh, council summary of action. I noticed one item on the agenda uh, was for first reading related to um, the wetlands and we commented about the um, uh, on something different than your recommendation. We suggested that conditional use permits and uh, zoning uh, that should be required. I think uh, it looks to me as if um, um, certainly Brooks Landing is a classic example where how important it would be to have proper information whenever there's a rezoning uh, because uh, you may want to designate some of that land as conservation Etc. That, that's just a comment. I, I know staff's recommendation was contrary to that, but I think that's a perfect illustration. And on the city's maps, they really do not reflect in any detail small wetlands. They seem to be primarily five acres in size or more. And so many zonings, rezonings, conditional use permits may involve <laughs> Some much smaller wetlands. So please, please think about that. The uh, next item on the agenda is city staff. Any reports? Yes, sir. At the beginning of the meeting, I passed out copies of ordinance number 7 2020. Um, most of this was considered by this commission at our previous meeting, um, but um, staff and legal added some additional language just to specify, to, to strengthen the, the, the fact that the conceptual plan requires compliance with the specified use on those plans. So we added that to um, 34-22C, 34-39C, um, 34-74C, and that's it. Um, this will be heard by City Council on, on Tuesday. On Tuesday, right. So we just wanted to notify the PNZ that we had included that language in the version that's okay. going to City Council. Any other staff report? No, sir. City Attorney. 
I don't think I have anything beyond the emails that I will get with you all individually to make sure that you get set up. And I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, prior to going to my report, uh, I skipped over petitions and requests from the public. Is there anyone in the public that would like to see us talk? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, my report, uh, I will be talking about river ponds in a minute, but as I received notification, many of you may have received notification that there's going to be a meeting on July the 30th and members of TEC, members of Planning and Zoning Commission, and members of the Development Committee and the Tree Committee are all invited. Uh, to come and peer, uh, I guess, with staff to try to have a discussion about the tree ordinance that we uh, considered. Uh, that's really a follow-up to the motion that was before the uh, city, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission. My question of the Planning and Zoning Commission, do you want a representative, a designated representative, to appear at that meeting? Do you desire individually uh, to appear representing yourself? Council has comment. I would just like to first start the conversation by saying, sorry I didn't mention this earlier. Thank you, Mr. Sievers, for bringing it up. I really do appreciate that. The meeting is scheduled for Thursday, July 30th. It is a staff-led meeting, and the members of TEC as well as other members of the community that have substantial weight to provide or have been invited to this 5:30 2 hour long meeting that will be like i said conducted by staff now the motion was for TEC to meet with the development community you heard that but P and Z is also invited to participate so uh, before we go any further i'd like you all to first raise your hand if you have an intent to appear at this meeting okay i see at least 3 4 maybe all of you okay so the meeting is not a planning and zoning meeting. So going forward, any comment you all make at the meeting could open up the door for sunshine violations. And so we have to be aware of what the sunshine does allow you to do and not do at this meeting. Number one, you cannot comment on each other's comments. That is the most important concept because you are fellow board members and your only time where you can comment on each other's comments on a matter that you will be voting on and this tree ordinance will come back before you would be at your designated meetings. And so this opportunity for the others to weigh in is really a good opportunity for you to sit and listen rather than to weigh in on each other's voices. Now, I don't want that to stifle you, but that is why I have to open this up and let you all know that if one person speaks, then the next person who speaks could then be having a sunshine violation just by commenting on what the person said. So when I made the motion uh, two weeks ago, it was not as complicated as this getting to be. I suggested that TEC meet with the development community and the staff. However, since, you know, it's gone amuck at this point, I will be the meeting to listen using my ears. But if there's any comment that needs to be made, I would suggest Chairman Seavers make that comment. Well, one of the things I've done and spent some time doing it, I did receive a copy of the transcript of our meeting. I've reviewed the minutes. I prepared what I understood our comments or concerns were. And um, you either have one heck of a secretary. This is just me, sir. <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> I tried to uh, to include basically every significant comment um, is what I did. 
<laughs> and that's based upon a transcript as well as the minutes of the meeting. And these were questions that These were concerns Z that we raised uh, about, uh, for example, the mitigation, should it be six inches or 20 inches in the staffs or some other number in between. For example, uh, the county has uh, different numbers, Port Orange has different numbers, et cetera. So um, that, that obviously is going to be an area of discussion. We did not come to a consensus as to what it was going to be at all. We just uh, di di discussed these items. There was concerns ra raised about the mitigation standards, their reasonableness, and also the other, were they strong enough? So those issues need to be looked at further in further detail. Uh, Member Murray, I think you talked about Florida friendly, what are acceptable trees to preserve? Uh, that was one of the things that we did discuss. I think yeah. they, I agree with you. I think that needs to be looked at by somebody. Yeah. Um, I do have a point of clarification because, again, my understanding at the time was it was about business coming to say, here's some compromises that we'd like. Hence the reason I wanted to go listen because they hadn't showed up before. Now, I don't know of the list. I saw the how many people were invited. I don't know who all there is business. I could recognize a couple of the names. But so I, I, I kind of thought the meeting was for them to come and dialogue on what they thought were solutions to this. Did I, did I miss that? Aren't they supposed to come with kind of a plan in place? That was the original intent. Right. When I uh, discussed how we developed the land development regulations years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, a special meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission, three or four meetings, the PNZ and the development community and the staff. That's what it consisted of. There was no violation of the Sunshine Law. Of course, it was 1986 or 85. <laughs> We didn't even have cell phones <laughs> or fax machines then. Um, that's the way it was originally intended to, for me to bring up. Yep. Um, in staffs, some of the staff are invited to it, some are not. A mm -hmm. uh, movie show of happens on Thursday. I'd like to have the popcorns uh, concession at this, where they review these the film, um, it got kind of out of hand. And, but if that's what they want to do, I'll sit there quietly and listen. Well, well, and again, it just, my concern when I read the memo um, that went out, it was not clear on what I thought our expectation was. So... Two gentlemen from business have come and expressed their concerns and basically said, you're being unfair. Um, and then we had staff's recommendation, and then we have the TEC's recommendation. But I, I was under the impression that it was going to kind of be business coming in and bridging the gap, having the discussion to say, this is what's really tough on TECs, and this is what. So. That was the original intention. In fact, member. Uh, Member Carey challenged the two people there to come to this meeting mm -hmm. whenever it should be. So I hope they've been given notice of the meeting on the 30th. If, they're, if they have been given notice and they don't show up, they're the ones to blame. So my question to staff is, is there like an agenda, a criteria? Is this just a free-for-all? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> mud wrestling. Mud wrestling. <laughs> We're still developing it, the the format of the meeting, how that will work. So. There will be some structure to it. It's, yeah. It won't be These just everybody duking it out at the meeting. Well, it, if, if I was appearing before the uh, this group, 
I would only want to do something like this. I, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm in the middle of uh, saying, I think you should do this, I think you should do that type of thing. My role would simply to be reporting, these are some of the issues that we feel as though should be resolved. Yeah, and again, I don't disagree at all with your list. I just, it seemed to have morphed into something different. Well, um, one, so. one thing I want to caution, because I've seen it with the tree committees at the county level, don't be, assuming there was some consensus, don't be surprised if there is an in, in the round run that occurs at the council meeting, because that happens. That happens. You think you have a consensus, uh, some, some individual doesn't like it, and so they do their own thing because they have a lot of good contacts. <laughs> so uh, I'm not totally optimistic as to the result, and that may have been the reason why Peggy didn't want to do it to begin with. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sir? We brought this to city council last year, and they said they did not want a committee. Yes. Last right. meeting. Uh, they said it again. So I, um, we're still working on how this is going to be handled, how staff is going to facilitate a discussion uh, at this meeting. And But I think what Mr. Severs has given us is a good framework that we can use to help okay. maybe identify themes. And I want to ask the commission, you and the rest of the commission, are there parts here that you could say that the uh, the group can find some kind of consensus on, some kind of medium on? We didn't, as a we didn't get to that point here. Well, do you think there's opportunities here that you uh, based on the oh, list yes. that you can hear? And, and which would, would be more priority that we probably should focus on? I'm just trying to figure out if there's some kind of guidance you can give uh, us. I don't, I don't know. The biggest okay. thing... <laughs> I don't know. The biggest thing in, to remember since that last meeting is at least give the TEC the revised ordinance. Uh, sir, we, I'm not sure why it, we were told that we didn't, that that, that, that the meeting that it, we were, it was stated that they never saw that. Yeah. Because the same version was given to all the people prior to that meeting. Now, no, we didn't give it to the formal body of the TEC, but they were, all the members received it by email at the same time as everybody else in that audience at that year last PNC meeting. So. And my final comment is, I guess, you know, in the meeting, I said my motion was send TEC's version forward to sure. council and then have them take action to bring the business to the table and resolve this. And council pretty much took that, I believe, uh, as let's create a committee, and I didn't want to go well, that route. But that was never the motion that okay. went forward. Okay. But again, my concern was, and we're right where I thought we would be, kind of in this situation of who's on first, who's on second, who's on third, what's the purpose of the meeting, when I thought it was about engaging business. And my concern is, is that that's my initial intention. So, uh, and again, just expressing my concern to staff, business had not come to the table Two gentlemen show up that night with strong opinions, which again, I think I stated, I, I get it, appreciate business, bring your community now and let's have a discussion. Um, so I, uh, and I have no problem staying home, believe me. <laughs> I've got apparently a, a comp plan to reread and <laughs> make notes on, um, but. I would just like to comment that as my, as of 11.45 this morning when I last talked to Peggy Busaka about the plan for this meeting, she was, as Brad said, undecided with the formal plan, uh, agenda. But the goal is to come up with four or five subject areas of discussion to be ironed out by the different parties that all have different perspectives, hoping to reach a compromise. The thing that we are trying to avoid is creating dueling ordinances from opposing camps because that will be counterproductive. And so I know that Peggy has been communicating verbally with the different people who've been invited to try to avoid that result. And that is what our goal is. And we don't 
have the ability to have the crystal ball that will tell us what will happen, but our hope is that people will come together, act civil, and provide constructive feedback. And the purpose of inviting you all is to hear that feedback firsthand so that when this item gets to you, you can have that foundational understanding of where these ideas, how these ideas were formed when it gets back to you. But this meeting is going to be videoed, correct? I will double check and it should be so that you have the ability to watch it, but I haven't checked into that yet. I mean, I think that helps as far as... Requested yet, and so we'll have to ask the city manager for permission to do that. Because that would, I think, allow people to really understand what happened in the meeting without potentially having, like you said, any kind of concerns about people commenting. Having been part a long time ago of the tree team or any of that, I get concerned that um, because of sunshine, I'm not I think there as a private citizen, right? which is unfortunate. So then I'm there as a planning and zoning, so you're better off watching at home. Well, Having because of popcorn. COVID and because of sunshine, I think those are two great reasons to have it rec recorded, and I will look into that and put it into my notes for tonight's meeting. Thanks. Yes, sir. Could uh, someone give me the definition of tree canopy, please, for my sake? Um, it varies depending on basically you would have to look at the ordinance um, d how the ordinance defines it but I think the the intent of the TEC version is a an uninterrupted natural canopy existing canopy or a canopy that's created so the overstory of the existing trees the crown of the tree right vegetation from okay. okay, I think okay. I understand. Thank you. Certainly. I, I'm not sure that it's necessary to uh, any action, but I just wanted to bring up the issue since it occurred since our last meeting. And uh, like I said, if I go, it will simply be to try to uh, say these are the major concerns or issues that we're that came out at our meeting without stating my personal position on them. So that's what I would do. All right, the, the second item uh, I'd like to uh, discuss with another form. <laughs> another what, sir? More paper. Oh, more, more paper. paperwork. Yes, yes. Uh, commencing in August of last year, 2019, I have raised a concern about uh, the River Palms development uh, on uh, Riverside Drive across from Titusville High School. Uh, I have no issue whatsoever concerning the condominiums that are under construction. Uh, my concern was uh, the permit that was issued that approved them, and I have raised this issue uh, more than once. The last time at a meeting on March the 3rd, subsequent to that, I had a conversation laid out to what my concerns were on March the 5th. Uh, this relates to a development agreement uh, on a piece of property. Uh, I'm quite concerned about uh, whether development agreement it has been followed, will be followed. Uh, skipping ahead, uh, the first Exhibit A shows the development agreement and the layout that was agreed upon, and this was after litigation and public hearings before Planning and Zoning Commission and the City Council. But it shows on the old... Uh, uh, Howard Johnson's site, uh, the 100 condominiums that could be built, which are under construction. The adjacent parcel I highlighted in yellow was an entrance and exit. 
the adjacent parcel, there was to be the entrance and exit from that location, as well as a retention pond. Uh, what was negotiated and agreed upon was that that area was going to be an open view so people traveling down the highway still would have a view of the Indian River and it was set aside in essence for that purpose just like uh, our proposed comprehensive plan says public and visual access to the Indian River shall be protected and maintained and that's said in several locations. Uh, that second parcel, I'm going to refer to it as the DeForest Realty parcel. That's, there was a building on there, the DeForest Realty was on there, and the one a little bit farther to the south, uh, I'm going to refer to as the Manzo uh, Putt-Putt Golf parcel, because that's what it was umpty ump years ago. In any event, that's what the agreement provides, and it was to be developed. Uh, the city along the way changed the uh, comprehensive plan and the ordinances to prohibit the county of submerged land towards the density. And that helped arise to the litigation of Bert Harris' claim and all of those things. Uh, exhibit uh, B shows numerous variances that were agreed to to allow this development because it fronted on a local street which only allowed six units per acre, uh, allowed a 35-foot height limitation, etc. All those variances were agreed upon by the, the community and agreed upon by the council, agreed upon by everybody and allowing a 57-foot uh, height of building, which is the, and I could go into further detail on. What occurred, you will see in Exhibit C, permit that was issued in 2019. You will see that the proposed development on that Parcel, which is the old Power Johnson's, has the 100 units on it. It shows the adjacent parcel, parcel 3, as future development. And parcel uh, 1 and 2, farther to the south, uh, future development. And based upon that, plan that was approved as part of the permit, you will see also the last page which is the development which does not show the retention pond on parcel 3 nor the ingress and egress to parcel 3. Interesting enough if if in fact this permit is issued in this manner this way you have the city has permitted 31.54 units per acre on that parcel. Clearly in violation of all kinds of codes and ordinances before, before and after. And because my concern is the developer who I know very well, he will take this and said, well, I can uh, put uh, single-family dwellings, I can put townhouses on parcel three for future development. You've permitted that way, contrary to the agreement. Now, I understand the rationale that along the way here, the city changed its code, the former code, if you had, more than one, if you had 50 units or more, you had to have two ingresses and egresses. And they changed the code along the way to uh, say if you have 100 or less, you can only have to have one entrance. However, the language of the development agreement expressly says development shall be done in accordance with the regulations in effect at the time of the agreement. The city code says the same thing. So if we've permitted something contrary to the code, contrary to the development agreement, 
the city needs to straighten this out because I think the city should honor its agreements. And I know Mr. Kotsky would bless his heart, but he has maneuvered this enough so he's put the city in a bind. And I've raised this issue since August of last year. They still can have the ingress and egress. It doesn't interrupt the, the building of the building. I don't care to interrupt the building of the building, but I expect them to comply with the agreement. And You know, if we truly believe that we want to protect the public view and visual, then please don't allow, because I know what will happen. Someone will come along and say, oh, that's very shallow. Give me a permit to do a little bit of fill to round it off to the other condominium buildings. And so they'll have more depth there. And they want to build, I mean, that parcel three, that is the upland portion, is about one acre. So under the code, he will argue, give me 15 units there. But that parcel is a part of the 100 units that have been permitted. And it should have been included in that. And I don't want the city <laughs> to back itself in a corner so bad you can't get out of it. And this is what is occurring. And Brett, I don't know whether you're familiar with this or not, but I know others are, and I, uh, I think it needs to be straightened out. So we are familiar with the development agreement and the permit and the questions you posed. Um, and we researched this, and we also looked at, I think the main question you had was whether they'll, they are going to be held compliant with the remainder of the development agreement. And I could say, yes, they will be held to it. And the best way we were able to make sure that happening is in our system, we have, we will flag, we have flagged this property. So I think the main concern you had was whether a future staff member would probably find some way to say, well, or not know about this agreement, and then they'll go forward with a change that's inconsistent with, with the actual agreement. The problem of it is the development agreement has expired. Well, Wait, what we did was, we understand, yeah, that was your other question. So what we did was we flagged this particular property to say that they have to adhere by the development agreement. So, yes, they got vested into it before it actually expired, so the rest of it they still have to conform to. And that's what we did. We tried to flag that into our system so that <coughs> any future staff would say, who knows, many years later we'll have a different staff, or are made aware of the fact that this is, an encumbrance well, the, on the property. Has the property owner been made aware of it? Mm -hmm. Well, they have question. a development agreement. I understand uh, that, but all I can tell you is, because I know the gentleman well, he says, you gave me a permit for uh, these 100 units, uh, 30, 31 units per acre. I showed you future development. I want to develop it. Well, it sounds like to me you're, you're concerned about the fact that he took some of the units from... <coughs> Let's see what you've got yes. on here. Parcel, what was designated for future on parcel two and one, and transfer them over to parcel four. Is that correct? Correct. All right. So overall, the whole development we look at is one big site. So the, the density is based on that. So if he's transferred, if we can look at it that way, some of the units he would agree to, according to this, this uh, agreement, to transfer it over to parcel four, he is less that now for the remainder of the development. So he's maxed out. So in other words, I don't think there's going to be a, an ability for him to increase additional units beyond what this agreement says for the entire development. And because we flagged this, I think the other issue about the uh, cross access going into parcel three and maintaining that as not developed with an actual vertical structure with like a building, um, I, you know, if, if we flag this property for any future planner or staff member to look at that and say, hey, wait a minute, there's an agreement here, I think that's really the best we can do. Uh, he's still, we have to abide by this. Um, and there's a maximum density, he has to abide by that. So I don't think he's going to be able to add additional units on the remaining parcels 
because it seems like he's transferred him over. Well, I, I think it's very important he be notified of that because he has a permit and reserve the other land for future development. Right, it is for future development, um, but according, it has to be abided by this this this, uh, this agreement. So yeah, we could certainly send this to him, concerns of the commission as well, and remind them we can do that if it hasn't been done already. Well, I've, I've been trying to find out the answer to that question. <laughs> as to whether the, the developer is aware of this? Well, the city's position on the issue, nobody would ever uh, get back with me. Well, our position is that he has to abide by the development agreement. And well, to ensure that, the best way we can do it is flag it in our system so that it comes off. Well, I'm surprised if it was flagged in the system, it should have been a part of the permit itself. That way, it's all tied in together, and the, per it, the permit itself does not include anything about that. I mean, I appreciate what you're saying. I agree with what you're saying, but uh, people look at permits, and I can do this, and then they sell the other part of the parcel uh, to John Doe, and they says, "Well, I'm not bound. The agreement is expired. I'm going to build uh, uh, 15, 20 units on uh, parcel three. Then what are you going to say?" I, I can understand what you're saying. Uh, typically, the permits aren't going to say refer back to or be consistent with uh, development agreement or master plan, whatever that order might be. Um, but I, I can certainly understand the concern. I think, though, overall, what we've issued as far as permit is within the bounds of what the development agreement says. So, I mean, if he's put extra units on parcel four, he's taken them away from somewhere else. Um, I, I Again, we can... Uh, we can just assure you that we've, we've flagged this in there so everybody in our staff is aware of it and our future staff will be made aware of it too, that it's there. And also, um, we can certainly make sure that the, uh, Mr. Kotze, the applicant, is aware of this as well. Um, as far as adding some reference on our permits, um, I can certainly ask our staff about that. To see, so if you ask for additional permits that were even on this existing one, that there's some kind of uh, statement on here about reference to this agreement. And what about the access road? So the access road, um, I think you mentioned that the access road on parcel four, so where the actual development is going in right now. So we believe that the it was required to have two access points. Yes, one of the access points is an emergency access point. No, I'm talking about the southerly access that's a part of the agreement. So you're talking about going across into parcel three? Correct. Yeah, so with that, again, that's part of this agreement. So we think that uh, if he does go forward with the next phase of this, he's going to have to address that. If it's got to be consistent with this, with this agreement. I guess my question is for our council. When there's an agreement like this in place, does that agreement transfer with the sale of those two parcels? Should he make a decision that he's going to sell those to someone else? Are those two parcels held to that same? The agreement runs with the land, but as has been mentioned, the agreement had an expiration date, which has passed. However, the owner currently, and the prior, of course, he's continued ownership, um, he submitted an application for the building permit prior to the expiration of the agreement. And because the permit was issued prior to that expiration date, the terms of the development agreement will continue to apply as long as he's operating under that permit. And so the current construction would be under an active permit. And should that construction stop or discontinue, then the ability to continue building beyond what he has already got in his permit will be very limited and we'll have to make that determination based on the timing of any submittals that may be received by the city from this particular owner in the future to make sure that it's consistent with the development agreement. I'm not sure that you addressed completely. But let me see if I, I got When I said it. it runs with the land, if he sold it, yes, they would apply. 
I guess the confusing statement is you, you said the agreement has expired. So if the agreement is expired and he sells that land, will the new owners be required under the guidelines of that since it's expired? If the property is sold during the middle of construction, then the permits would be have been issued to the contractor and it would depend on whether those permits remain active. But the permits are issued not to the owner, but necessarily the contractor. So it would depend on the relationships between the parties. And I can't say I know the answer to that. I, I can try and answer that. It but doesn't when, matter when for the other owner. quick yeah. clarification. Once the, build, once the building that is under construction right now is complete. Once the CO is issued. Yep. Uh, because the rest is just future, he can then sell that property and it wouldn't be under the same agreement. Well, the agreement, the, allows, would be the, the agreement allows the property to be constructed according to the agreement. Right. Mm -hmm. And after the CO is issued, if the future owners mm -hmm. of the property want to develop, it would have to be according to current code. So that answer is my exact concern that you received because they could sell off parcel three and say it's one acre and put 15 units there, completely block public access and view of the river, totally contrary to the whole agreement and what was negotiated in the very beginning. That's my concern. And I guess my next question then is for you. Yes. Um, so we're here at the planning and zoning meeting. As planning and zoning, we're, our hands are tied. So I think it's more a question that you're trying to get answered from. By the way, I'd like to know the answer too, but it's not really a planning and zoning thing, but it's, is it something that should be brought to the city council, I guess? <laughs> I was trying to avoid all that. Okay. Out of respect for staff. I was trying to avoid that. If I could simply get an answer. But maybe I should. I was just gonna tell you that typically with these kind of things, the the successor of the developer of the developer, and that's really the new owner, are still bound by the agreement. So it really depends on the terms of the agreement. And if one portion of it is completed, I mean, we've got the example of, of Antigua Bay, which was mentioned earlier tonight. That's a huge development. It's got a master plan to it. Uh, whoever the developer is, whether it's 20 years later, the same developer, or a new developer, rather, are going to be bound by that same agreement and how they're supposed to develop. If they want to negotiate terms of that agreement or renegotiate it with, it, with the city, they certainly do that. But that's, a whole, that's going through the process again, basically, with us, with the city. I think... I think, though, that the way we see this is that we have a development agreement, so now part of it has started. So now the rest of it is tied to it. So we, I think we would be enforcing the rest of that agreement, regardless who that owner is. So you sell off a portion of it. That, that's a vested rights on that property that are controlling it now. Right, and as I stated, the, it runs with the land, the entire Set all of the land that is covered by this development agreement has these protections in place in our system that would prevent any building permit from issuing. I know that's the best we can say right now, and it's not the warm and fuzzy that you're looking for, but we have attempted to insert that control where we can. Yeah, and again, it's just one of those things. So where I came from, very rarely did who we were building a property for actually own that property until the CEO was issued. So as an example, we would build data centers for American Express. Um, and it wasn't until the day that we turned it over commissioned to them that it became American Express's property. And by the way, it wasn't IBM's either. It was the general contractor who owned that property up until that point in time. On more than one occasion, there was a situation in which once the CO was taken, then they went back to the city and would then parcel off additional land. Because we often bought buildings and then made them hardened. Um, so again, not an easy thing. And um, there's just this side of me that was 
dealing in those circumstances for so many years that I go, oops, <laughs> I should trust people, but I guess I don't. So if it truly is with the land, I get it. it I just understand the concern there is that, that after the CO is there, that gets sold off. What I'm hearing you say is it's still bound by the number of units that could be under the initial agreement. So they can't do any additional ones based on that agreement, even though the agreement's expired. Okay. Uh, that's only uh, all I had in my report. Uh, any other commissioner have it? Report? I do. Yes, sir. Two things. I won't make it as lengthy as the last one, but I think it was our last meeting before the coronavirus hit where we were asked to approve or deny the 10 stories on what was the Kirk's shopping plaza. And we didn't have a plan. We were not presented with any site plan or concept plan. And we just told it was going to be 10 stories. And we voted against that. We voted to not deny it. The next meeting, six days later, it came up before council with the plans, grand plans of eight story buildings laid out in a certain way. And it was unanimously approved by the council. I can't tell you the number of calls I got from council members telling me why did you, the P and Z deny that? It was totally different when it came up before council and then it came up before council at P and Z. Totally different. It made us kind of look like fools. The second thing I would say is almost at the same time, it might have been earlier, there was a piece of property on uh, South Street that uh, Commissioner Fisher and Stan Retz had come before the P and Z and said they want to develop this, and they were kind of antsy for our approval. They had met with the neighborhood, and we said, you know, meet with them. Really, we had that. Uh, put off to the next meeting, and we finally approved it. And they said, we're really anxious to get started. Now there's a big sign, a for sale sign, on the piece of property. And I think in those two cases, that we were taken by surprise. And that is the cause of the ordinance we recently recommended approval of five years the St. John's Water Management had to approve it because it didn't exist for that one. It was like seven or eight years. But we said, okay, you're anxious to develop it. I was real disappointed in that too. That's all I have. And the other commissioner have a report? Yes, commissioner. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly on um, and make it clear on why I sometimes dissent when everybody else is voting yes. And it truly is based on we need to fix certain things. I hold things pretty tight. Um, I don't have the history that you have. Hence, if we have plats that we're seeing and we're not involved in the next, we need to figure out an action plan so that that is a step. There's precedence based on other cities and counties. My frustration comes when we have expectations that we can do something that there is not ordinances or codes that support it. And engineering, I, I wonder You'll see me say I can't support that because we're asking them to do something that is already part of the process. So never having seen the whole process all the way down, 
nice presentation tonight. It's some, I sometimes get kind of caught up in some of those things. So do we have the right to really go back and ask them to do something that's going to be done in the next phase? Do we have the right to ask them to potentially make lots smaller in order to accommodate what I agree, I want open recreation space, I want parks, I want all those things, but our hands are somewhat tied right now. Hopefully, with our next round of comp plan items, we can get that clarified, but then we gotta follow it up with the ordinances so that it's really clear we want certain things to happen. And so I'm not trying to be just belligerent or anything, it's based on what there is on the table today, that's what I will vote on, versus what we would really like it to be. So it's just a stickler type thing. So I know sometimes it just seems like I'm the only one saying no, but there's logic behind that no. We need to remember that comp plans and ordinances are two different things, and that comp plans need to be flexible ordinances or law. And regulation. So planning doctrine really discourages the marriage of this two too tightly. That's all I'm saying. Uh, um, again, I just want to clarify. So if it's the case of open areas, open space, and the comp plan is encouraging us to do parks and our ordinance, and, and it's a broad statement, but our ordinance is, is holding us to a whole nother thing. And I agree they didn't have the fountain, but I, I, I couldn't quite justify the 20 additional feet based on the way the ordinances were written. So those are things that I think we almost need to flesh out to say, okay, we either need to be involved in the next phase or ordinance needs, I, I, it's like our hands are tied. And that's what frustrates me. Um, why we're not involved in the next phase makes absolutely no sense to me. And never seen that before. So what's the steps that we need to do to start resolving some of these challenges that constantly come up for us? Um, and that's my wish. And again, I don't have the number of years of history and things like that, but that's where you'll see me dissent on certain things. Is there, but my is there goal an, is to fix I, it. I would encourage you if there's some items on the list that I passed out mm -hmm. of issues that you agree with, uh, you certainly welcome to bring it up in the meeting. We'll see whether or not there are four votes. <laughs> 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 and then we can proceed. Excellent. Any other commissioner have any, any comments? Mr. Grant, we welcome you aboard, sir. I'm glad Thanks. to have you. Or usually five hours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hearing nothing else, uh, I think we've covered everything. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>